the Bible. Is it hard to understand? When it comes to reading the Bible, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that this is the Word of God. The seals have been broken, and the truth is here. And when we go throughout the scriptures, when we go throughout extra biblical records, we find that the language that God employed, that he used to create the heavens and the earth, was the Hebrew language. Christ said, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But yet no one, no religious leader, no religious church out there anywhere can now identify the 12 tribes of Israel. Can we? God is quite simple, but it seems as if man makes understanding him hard. What are those mysteries? The truth of your book. And the truth will make you free. The Hebrew and Bible Academy, you're invited. Forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Abba Noah, Shabbat Shemayah, Kodash Hayah Shemcha Bahaya, Malakwabka Tabaa, Ratazawanka Hayah Ashah, Baaratazah Kowa, Hayah Bashemaya. The thunder now will come how you want. What's the luck now? How what walk now? What's the luck now? How what walk you now? Well, I are. But you are now on the side of one of all. I was shy now. Man ride for Yalaka. Come a lock walk for her Allah. Shalom, brothers and sisters. I'm Elder Rikashia, along with Elder Lawyer here, live with our weekly Sabbath lesson. Shabbat Shalom. Okay, first and foremost, I would like to say all praises be to the Most High, Ahaya, Bahashim, Yeshaya, Wa Rewak, the God of Israel, in the name of Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Thanking the Most High for allowing us to be here another day, another Sabbath, within the walls of Babylon, bringing again the captivity of the Most High's people through the Word of God, the Bible. Okay, the Bible. <laughs> All right, come, jumping right into the lesson. Make sure you had your pen, pen and pads ready. We're going in right in 
on a lesson, a discussion today, a Sabbath lesson, that our King Christ was and is more than a prophet. More than a prophet, okay? Now, before I go in, uh, let me make sure uh, updates are given concerning what we'll be going into tomorrow, Elder Lawyer. Tomorrow we're going into who is Edom, week four. Who is Edom? Satan's agents. Okay, we're going to go into it to show you that, yes, a nation of people in the earth has purpose, purposely hid themselves prophetically in modern day religion. The nemesis of Jacob, who is Edom? Okay, we're going to go into it and we're going to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt who are the Edomites in the earth and actually break down why they decided to hide themselves in plain sight. Okay, that and more will be in the academy, including what's going on, uh, going on with uh, the so-called war. Tomorrow we'll be discussing that. The real, the real agenda behind this war, moving straight out of the the cough into another narrative mm -hmm. that will lead to more people in this earth getting oppressed by the one world power. All of this stuff is on schedule, folks. One day, one day the virus disappear and then the next day a war. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all of these things are strategic, but at the end of it, it's to target God's people, to put the military and other things in place that will engage God's people like they did in 70 AD. Okay, so don't fall for the news narrative. This is all theater. This is all theater. And if those that are looking at Bible prophecy and understand Bible prophecy, you'll understand how the European powers, the Ten Horns, is using the theater of sickness, famine, shortages, war to actually build what? A, a wall or a garrison around a wall around the people. It's about strategically putting military in place for an eventual engagement like they did against our people in 70 AD. And I'm going to be discussing that. Okay. The joker in all of this is Iran. That's the joker in all of this. Let's not be diverted or sidetracked with what's going on strictly in Ukraine and Russia. Is it important? Will people get oppressed and all that through what's going on there? Yes. Yes. But just like the Rahm Emanuel, that's right. His Satan, one of Satan's sons claimed or stated, we cannot let a good disaster go to waste. <laughs> okay. So the whole thing is these narratives is to do what? To progress Satan's new world order against the population of those who believe in Christ. Now, there are levels to this. Are we saying that Russia, you know, politically isn't doing what they're supposed to do to sustain it? Well, what they think they should do to sustain their country. That's another layer in of itself. Yes. There is a narrative where Russia feels that their security is being compromised if a part of what was once the USSR joined with NATO. That is true. That's true also. So there's layers there. Russia is doing what they can to protect their country. But all in all, NATO was trying to come in so that they can actually strategically be able to eventually 
with America, Israel, and other countries, the Western world, Rome, at the helm, to eventually go against Iran. Iran is the joker prophetically. Everything else is leading up to that. So there's going to be a lot of written narratives that will distract people, okay, in this time concerning what they are looking at as a war right now, okay? When the real war is against the people who are suffering in these ghettos, the children of Israel, that's with, that's the war that continually gets ignored. All right. So I'm going to be going into that and more during the Academy tomorrow. Okay. So, um, if this interests you, Hey, make sure you join the Academy. And if you haven't, if, if you haven't joined it already, you can do so by going to history times dot org. Okay. Go there and roll and our administrators and those who are working around the clock will make sure that you receive your information in a timely fashion through your tablet, through your computer or phone to get in by 9 a.m. tomorrow. OK, now we're going to be right up on the news and everything. As soon as we're going to jump right in tomorrow with the news right after Elder Lawyer's uh, Hebrew. But please, I need you all to make sure that if you're going to do it, you know, enroll in a timely fashion so that we can have you in there because the news is going to be just off the charts. And in respect of YouTube's guidelines, and we respect the guidelines, there's things that we just not, can't discuss here today. Okay? So we'll be able to go, dove more into that uh, tomorrow concerning the war and how the world powers is actually using it for something prophetic. Okay. That's not world war three, but all in all, what they have going on there will continue what the so-called Biden administration started, which is the oppression of the people within the United States because war d does what it drives up the cost of everything. So now through so-called Corona and all those things, prices went through the roof with them having to send all this money to other people who weren't working and all these other things with the companies uh, uh, being stressed with no employees doing a certain amount of time. That's inflation. So when you throw money out to all these other components that, that the country wasn't prepared to deal with emergency, whatever, whatever, that drives up the cost of everything. So this is a financial war against the poor. A rich person or a person who's filthy rich d doesn't care about what groceries cost when they have their own farms and all those things. But this is going to drive up the price of gas, petrol, and all that. And they're going to have a built-in excuse so that if anything happened within the United States, it's conveniently blamed on Russia. Watch what I'm telling. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on and automatically the bad guy, the political bad guy has already taken center stage in which, in which they can politically blame everything that goes wrong within the United States on Russia. Mm -hmm. It's more so a press on the population within the country in of itself, America. You got something on that, Olivia? No, good? sir. No, All right, sir. just want to make sure. Let me turn off this beast mode real quick. All right, it's right here. <laughs> this this people's tracker, and you know that's why we have uh, that's why we have uh, uh, cell blocks. You can get that on our website, drop your phone in and disappear. Also, I want to announce that the calendars have went out to brothers and sisters. I hope you are enjoying the calendars. And yes, it gives you the correct times according to Sabbaths. But you can still use that calendar as a regular calendar. But know what days the holy days fall on and the Sabbaths fall on, including New Year's and New Moons, which translates to New Months change changes of seasons 
There's no calendar like this in the earth. I'm telling you right now, it's the biblical calendar of Sabbaths. There have been many people up until this time who tried to get that calendar together and get it correct. And the Most High gave it to us to convey and give out to the people. Now, because it costs the designs and all those things, we're keeping that cost modest at $20 for the annual calendar, right? So it doesn't cost too much. Make sure we ship it out and all those things, but we have to pay for the cost because, you know, it's a design calendar. It's nice pictures. You can frame whatever the case might be for only $20. But if you don't have a calendar, you can always go to gatheringofchrist.org, look under holy days and all that, and the calendar dates are right there. So it's not as if we are uh, uh, withholding the true information concerning the days that, that you must be on point concerning Sabbaths. That's an obligation to all of us to know that time to, and, and, and in respect to worship the Most High on the days that he said do so. Okay? So the calendar is something different. It's something you can have as a designer piece in your kitchen as other places. Nice pictures been put together the scriptures are there to let you know how exact the sabbath calendars are for you and on top of that on top of that you can just look at each month and know what day your sabbaths fall on and what day your what you got it your holy days fall on and these are the same holy days that are being kept in heaven the same time so that's right Thou shalt be done, like Elder Lawyer said in his prayer, the Lord's Prayer, thou shalt, shalt be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the calendar helps us to do what? To rehearse the righteous acts, to actually link in and be on the same wavelength as the heavens. And guess what? We're already doing it here. So those that are found keeping his Sabbaths, that's a sign between heaven and those who truly believe in the God of Israel, who is the God of all gods. So make sure you get that calendar. Go to gatheringofchrist.org, gatheringofchrist.org, and get your calendar, okay? Wanted to put that out there. Now, let's get into the class. Let's get into the class, right? <laughs> All right, all right. This is going to be a nice one. Our King Christ is and was more than a prophet. Now, this is why I'm going into this particular lesson today because you have so many new claims out there concerning this man. Christ, right? And you have other religions that would attempt to downplay his importance, not just to the children of Israel, but to the world. And as much that we are living a day where Satanists and atheists and non-believers will outright lie and claim, listen, that Christ never existed. Now, when someone makes statements like that, guess what, brothers and sisters? They're not even in the conversation. Mm -hmm. That's right. Any historian will listen to, to this person speak and say, well, okay, he can't even be in the room concerning the, the discussion of Christ and how Christ politically and religiously impacted the world, including, including all other religions that, that are at odds with Christ's doctrine. He, not, he didn't just impact his people. Christ impacted the world and every other religion that's at odds with him. See? And this is all what? Historically documented. 
even if you don't believe in Christ, even if you don't follow his doctrine, you know he existed. Mm-hmm. If, if you have any insight to true history or any, any understanding of true history. So when someone, when you have people conversating, debating, or even questioning whether Christ existed, if they bring up that, they're not even worth listening. They're not even worth actually listening to for a moment because history all over, all over outside of America have did what? Chronicled crisis interactions historically with their people. (laughs) Right? Now, Elder Lawyer, before I go, anything you have to say on that before I go? Yes, sir. Just one quote. This is one book of many and uh, what you're saying is 100% exact because the general consensus among scholarship, whether you are an atheist, a non-believer, believer, believer, agnostic, theist, or what have you, whatever belief system you have personally, the general consensus among scholarship is that Christ was an historical figure that actually walked the face of the earth. Now the differences come in when now the you know the discussion of did he do miracles, did he resurrect? Those are the things that are debated. But as far as his actual existence, that cannot be denied. Here's just a quick reference called the historical the historical Jesus. Let me get the author. The historical Jesus. It Here's says, a reference. Come on. Yep. Ancient evidence for the life of Christ by Gary. Let me get his name here. It's kind of hard to see his name. All right, by Gary R. Haberman. Okay, I'm going to read this real quick. This is from the uh, 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 the, the, the title, Salakia, of the chapter is, Did Jesus Ever Live? Did he ever live? And it's ridiculous that that question is actually out there, but go on, other way. Yes, sir. Very few scholars hold the view that Jesus never lived. I'm going to read that again. Very few scholars hold the view that Jesus never lived. This conclusion is generally regarded as a blatant misuse of the available historical data. Even Rudolf Bultmann in his program of Demythologist, that's a lot, I can get a little tongue tied here, mouth a little dry. Uh, Demythologizing uh, the New Testament said, by no means are we at the mercy of those who doubt or deny that Jesus ever lived. So he's citing even those who do not necessarily believe in Christ. Even they must admit that Christ is an historical figure. Hmm. So to say otherwise, would it, like the elder just mentioned, you pretty much be laughed out the room. So I'm glad you're bringing that up because this... This is really to get to the the crux of it when it comes to, hold on, where is, yeah, Uh, when it comes to crisis discussion, it seems as if when it comes to, let's put it this way, according to the Gentiles, religious figures that should be revered or respected, right? It seems as if there's no pushback on any from any Gentile against Buddha. There's minimal pushback when it comes to Buddha and Buddhists within, you know, religion. There's no pushback where Christians and others are going against Buddhists and Buddha. Mm-hmm. Buddha is revered, what? As a respectful religious figure throughout the earth with no pushback. Muhammad, whom the Arabs look to honor as their prophet, who gave them some level of credibility really in the earth. Okay. It was through prophet that the so-called prophet Muhammad, that the Arabs will gain some level or gain some level of respectability religiously in the earth. So you see very little pushback against Muhammad, the prophet, the so-called prophet. Mm -hmm. But why is, why is it brothers and sisters that there's so many questions and vitriol 
an argument when Christ is brought up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Why? You ever wonder that? Have you ever wondered why this key figure is rejected? Is rejected, brothers, sisters, when in comparison to other prophets or teachers throughout the Gentile world religiously, when you compare Christ to them, why is Christ the most rejected? Huh? Why? Well, we're going to go into it. But before I go into that, our lesson, our king, he's our king. Okay, and he will bring a, uh, he will establish a government right here on earth. Our King Christ was and is more than a prophet. Now, just for some historical credence on what we're we were saying concerning Christ's history, right? If I'm going to prove or disprove Christ historically, I must go back into history, the time Christ walked the earth. That's what I must do. Of course, atheists, Satanists, and others would have you say, well, Christ never existed. Why? Because if you don't believe in Christ, you're condemned. And what better way to cut you off than to have you believe he never existed? See, if he existed, then now every individual, Jew and Gentile alike, has a choice to make. Outright. I can I can understand a Satanist who's destined to be to burn in hell to be out outright saying, well, Christ never existed because now he absolved himself from what? From believing in him. He don't have to believe in him because he's convinced himself with that thwarted mentality that Christ never existed. It takes accountability off the table for that individual when it comes to believing and understanding what the power which comes, that comes with believing. So if I'm going to go into crisis or try to validate or discredit Christ historically, I must at least go into the history to be credible, right? Now, you'd be better off saying, like most people do anyway, yes, he existed, but I really just don't believe in him. You are more credible and have a greater chance with him just by being outright, letting your nay be nay and your yay be yay yay and just have a stance. The majority of people who claim he never, he never existed is because what is because their life is contrary to the standards and the morality Christ stood for. We are to compare ourselves to him with he, Christ, being the son of God as a path that leads us to a kingdom that will soon come here. That's right. See, that gives us a path, a model to model ourselves after. Why wouldn't you or an individual want to aspire to be a man such as him? Why? Unless you're evil, immoral, wicked, right? Unrepentant. So let's go back to crisis time, may we? There was a historian by the name of Tacitus. For you unbelievers, look it up. Tacitus was an historian during the time between Christ and the fall of Jerusalem that really began around 64 
AD. Tacitus. Who was Tacitus? The Roman historian and senator Tacitus referred to Christ. Now, Christ didn't exist, but this, this man who's written in history, look him up, <laughs> referred to him. A senator. Okay? This is for those out there who's, who's having these mundane, not going anywhere debates concerning whether or not Christ existed. His execution, Tacitus referred to, to Christ, his execution by Pontius Pilate, and the existence of early Christians in Rome in his final works. Annals written C.A.A.D. 116, Book 15, Chapter 44. So I've mentioned many days, Elder Lawyer, in the Academy and out, that Christ is written all through the annals of Rome. Understand this, folks. The height of Rome was actually established to do what? to seek out that child who would free and who at the very end would unite his people against the Roman Empire. That was one of their religious agendas and along, along with the Roman priesthood <laughs> is, to, is to prophetically be in position to get rid of this child who was prophesied in their omens to establish our people again as the people of God. All through the annals of Rome, Christ is written, not just the Bible. Now, the context of this passage is the six day great fire of Rome that burned much of the city in 64 during the reign of the Roman Emperor Nero. The passage is one of the earliest non-Christian references to the origins of Christianity. The execution of Christ described in the canonical gospels and the presence and the persecutions of Christians in first century Rome. So we're really technically the fall of our people in Jerusalem started around 64 AD when Nero, an Edomite, a Roman emperor, burned cities in Rome only to blame it on our people, the Jews, the Israelites, the blacks who were in Israel. He, he created a false flag so that now he would have a pretext to do what? Place Roman military within the borders of Jerusalem. See? He would cause the chaos and through it pass legislation that would press our people. Just like anything you see today, which led to the fall of Jerusalem under Vespasian and Titus, 70 AD and those who believed in Christ began to run into different parts of Africa and different parts of the earth, Morocco, different areas to flee from the Roman persecution. This is history. This is history. Now, now, everything that, I'm, that I've just mentioned, folks, was prophesied out of the Bible through Christ's own words and is confirmed through Gentile writings, other nations' writings, Rome's writings, India's writings, information within the Middle East. Even, folks, in Iran, they have annals and all that concerning the interaction with, with Christians, with black Christians. Only for us to sit here, and this is how you know Babylon is exactly what the Most High said it would be. Confusion. Only America is, 
America is the only place where you can philosophy to a degree to claim that one of the most prominent historical figures that have ever lived never existed. You can only find that garbage right here in America. This is really the home and the root of total chaos and confusion. <laughs> More. Let's get more here. Scholars generally consider Tacitus' reference to the execution of Jesus by Pontius Pilate to be both authentic and historical value as an independent Roman source. Mm -hmm. An independent Roman source. This has nothing to do with what? biased according to those who believe in the Bible. He have no stake in the game. He has no, he's, he, 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 he don't have no, no fighting again, no dog. I mean, no horse in the race. This is just historical information where a Senator was actually a historian doing what chronalizing and breaking down and writing history. He witnessed which was politically affecting Rome. The same way today you have the government, uh, 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 like, like the Southern Poverty Law Center and all these others who realize the truth of us being Israelites has now affected the earth religious and re religions and everything politically. And by doing so now, they have to now write about Israelites. See, they have to write about it because it's affecting their agendas politically. Well, that's the same thing that was going on during the time of Rome. Christ was actually having a serious effect on government, their policy, the belief systems, when it came to their paganism and their priesthood. Gentiles after Christ began to believe in us and began to walk away from Roman temples, which was what? Affecting their government. More. Let me just stay here. Paul Eddy and Gregory Bod, uh, Boyd state that is now firmly established that Tacitus provides a non Christian confirmation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That is documented he was also crucified. Mm -hmm. And it's non biased. Let me repeat that again. That's right. Gregory Boydsdale, Boydsdate, that is now firmly established with Paul Eddy that, the, that Tacitus provides a non-fiction confirmation of, of the crucifixion of Jesus. His true name is Yeshaya, but we're going to use this uh, just for edifying. Historian Ronald Miller has stated that the annals is Tacitus crowning achievement, which represents the pinnacle of Roman historical writing. See? Facts are stubborn. The pinnacle of Roman, wh why would they need to write about Christ, folks? Because he was affecting the politics of Rome. <laughs> right? Scholars view it as establishing three separate facts about Rome around the time of AD 60, that there was a sizable number of Christians in Rome at the time, that it was possible, it was possible to distinguish between Christians and Jews in Rome. You know why it was possible to distinguish between the two? Because the Jews and Israelites were black. That's why you can distinguish between the two. You don't have someone put on different types of clothing and differentiate them because of the clothes they have on. Well, he's wearing fringes and this guy is wearing, is wearing a suit. So they must be different ethnicities. That's not how you do it. They were able to be distinguished in Rome because the Israelites 
during that time were distinguishedly different in what? Appearance. It was our people. So that's why we were able to be distinguished. Talking about they, can, they were able to be distinguished at that time. <laughs> why? Because the Israelites, according to the Bible, were and are people of color. Black people, if you want to really make it clear. Not no Middle Eastern look and all that other stuff they try to do. To do what? To muddy the waters. There was a sizable number of the Christians in Rome at the time. And at that time, it was possible to distinguish between Christians and Jews in Rome. <laughs> I wonder why. And that at that time, pagans made a connection between Christianity in Rome and its origin in Roman Judea. And then it actually gives you an actual writing from the time of Tacitus, folks. The passage in context from ancient Rome is documented. <laughs> so if you have anybody out there debating or conversating on whether or not Christ ever existed, point them to this video and tell them to shut down. Create another argument for content. Stop trying to use Christ as a trigger to try to gain those to the satanic side who believe in him. Okay, here it is documented and here it is. What are we seeing here, folks? Archaeological proof. And this to me, brothers and sisters, a lot of what I'm doing right here usually is only done in the academy on a historical scale. But I needed to put this out there real quick from a, excuse me, from a, an historical perspective. Usually we deal with the history and chronology and all that in the academy, but I needed to put it out there right now because the world has gone mad. Okay. The world has gone mad. So the only thing y'all would need to do at any time to destroy that fallacy on whether or not Christ existed is to cite the historical proof in the writings of Tacitus. Elder Lloyd, you got something? Yes, sir. Just a key point uh, off the back of one of those last points. If you scroll back up to yeah. uh, that last sentence at the uh, right before it comes down to this point here. Right here? Yep, where it says that uh, uh, where it was mentioning the, the dis distinction between the Jews and the... The, uh, the distinction between the Jews right here. Right here. It says Christians in Rome at that time that it was possible to distinguish between Christians and Jews in Rome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it goes on to say, and at that time, the pagans make a connection between Christianity in Rome and its origins in Roman Judea. In Roman Judea, yes. Right. So in other words, they were able to make a difference. You have appearance, but then you also have way of life to show that those early Christians were following what? What type of customs were they following? Were they following after the customs of the pagan Romans? Were they joining in the pagan Roman festivals? No, they were following the customs of what? The Jews. When you read this here in 1 Peter 4 and 3, it shows you that the way of life of those who believed in Christ, uh, they were pulling out of, those who were being converted, they were pulling out of the way of, of pagan Rome and living more closely to the way of what? The Israelites and their customs. Mm. 1 Peter 4 and 2 says that you that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. So before they were being converted into the teachings of Christ, many of the Jews and Gentiles as well were living in, they were living as Gentiles. How so? When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they, the pagans of Rome and other places, mm. wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. So when they started recognizing the pagans, when they started realizing that we were no longer dealing in excess of wine, 
You were no longer dealing in lasciviousness. You were no longer dealing in the pagan festivals and revelings. They started to realize that it was a difference. There was a difference, not just in appearance, but also in custom, how we lived our lives as quote unquote Christians. That's exactly. That. Which began to have a profound effect right. on the citizens of Rome. Think about that. Morality began to spread amongst not just our people, but the heathens. Mm -hmm. The heathens began to, to do what? Set standards for themselves, patterning themselves after the walk of Christ, understanding, understanding the value of actually renouncing pagan ways to convert into our belief systems. Mm -hmm. That's right. So Rome was like, no way. If we allow these people to continue to teach, there'll be no Roman Empire. Mm. They're going to convert everyone. So they had to do what? They had to destroy our people, which was prophesied the desolation of Daniel. Because we were having a profound effect on what? The people, the Roman citizens that were controlled under Rome. Right? You have to understand this beast, which is the Roman Empire, this beast, which is that scarlet color beast that sit on many waters, she thrive on immorality. This is how she takes souls. Mm -hmm. if, if the pagans are immoral, if they do wickedness, unchastity, and sin, these automatically become servants of Satan to be utilized for his bidding. No pagans, no Roman world. So this is, this is why they push immorality and wickedness so that Satan can have souls to continue to, to, to do what? To grow his empire. Mm. Christ, Christ was doing what? He put a, he, he immediately, he immediately, folks, put a stopper mm. into that society. And people started, Gentiles and others began to to view our belief system as an alternative belief, which was scary in Rome for the Roman emperor. Mm -hmm. That's right. See? So politically, Christ became a problem. As long as it was amongst us, to them, well, okay, we'll keep an eye on him. Right. But you know what? It's okay. We'll keep an eye on him. And it's depending on how far he gets or how much he grow, whether or not the emperor will intervene when it was just affecting the Israelites. Mm -hmm. But when it started getting to the Gentiles and other people started coming through, now it became a political issue. Now, let's go now. <laughs> Our King Christ is and was more than a prophet. First of all, he was prophesied out of the Old Testament. That's right. Elder Lawyer, let's get Genesis 49. Genesis 49, and let's go straight to Judah. Yes, sir. Genesis 49, verse 8. Yes. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Judah is he whom thou brother shall praise. That's right. Judah, the tribe of Judah, sets the trends in this earth for the world. For the world. Not just when it comes to culture. We, Judah, sets the culture. And all of the brothers follow suit to Judah. When Judah wears clothes a certain type of way, or a Judite woman act a certain type of way, automatically the other tribes begin to pattern their fashion after Judah, just like in the earth today. Judah has a fashion in of itself where by default, even if you don't know your Judah, everyone looks to you for what? The future fad in culture, rap music, fashion, you name it, singing. Automatically through the spirit, not just the tribes, but the rest of the world follows Judah. 
That's what it means, praise. It's something about Judah that what? Impacts the earth. And this is why the Gentile nations keep Judah close to them. Pacify Judah. Put Judah in certain high positions. Knowing Judah's spiritual influence, a gift given through God himself. Judah, the trendsetters. Judah, the trendsetters. It says, he is whom thy brother shall praise. They will always look to Judah for direction. And this is why, you know, we're beseeching and begging our brothers who's dealing with criminality and drugs and all that and doing all those things. Well, no, nah. you can use that same influence and power for the embedment of your people. You can use that same swag and all that like Christ did. Listen, Christ had a lot of, let me tell you, he had a lot of energy that drew people to him naturally, like a lot of you, but he didn't use his power. He didn't use his influence for wrong. See, we naturally got that influence, but the devil have convinced our people to use that influence to harm our people. To draw them towards a culture of what? Destruction. Hence the reason I'm seeing Dr. Dre and all that. Why do you think they have them halftime at the Super Bowl? You think they would have did that five, ten years ago? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when it was about the integrity of the game and this, that, and the other. Now you got gangster rap live at the Super Bowl. What are they trying to influence? Because they understand the power of Judah one way or the other. Whether it be good or evil, Judah is the trendsetter. See? Come on, let's go. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Hold up now, hold up. I'm looking at this. Brothers and sisters, please help us out. We're about a thousand likes down. It doesn't cost you anything so that other people can get in. We're about to get into these scriptures. But I need y'all to at least hit the like button. We're still at a hundred thousand. We thank you for the hundred thousand uh, uh, subscribers. We 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 broke that glass ceiling, but come on, brother and sisters, doesn't cost you anything. We're still being shadow banned, so <laughs> just hit the like button, right? Read that last piece of the lawyer. Genesis forty nine verse eight. Yes. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Come on. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thine hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. That means. Whoever, who's ever in position, I'm going to have you close right up under them, Judah. See that? That means Judah politically will be in position right up under the enemy because the enemy keeps their enemies, their friends close, but their enemies even closer. So every great empire will be right there. Judah. Okay, that's how it is, brothers and sisters. Even during the time of the Persian Empire, Sister Esther was right in position to marry the Persian king that would ward off a depopulation of our family in that area, in those provinces. We are, we're always right there close politically, the same way we're at the neck of our enemies here in America where they'll keep us close in fear of what we would eventually find out. And when we find out we Israel, and at that point they shift politically to begin to what? Crush our people. See? So that's why they keep us close, to see if our people have found out yet, to see if our people are going to side on the side of righteousness, Opposed to what? Being pacified. They'll pacify us. They even wanted to pacify Christ. At one point, there was one city who, who tried to make Christ king in one of the areas, and he ran out of there. Like, nah, I'm good. See? So it tells us Judah would be at the neck of thine enemy. So this is why they're going to pass, they try to pacify us. Okay? 
Black Lives Matter. Race, racist, uh, racial equality. Symbolism and slogans. That's all it is. Who cares about your words? To Hades with your t-shirts. When our people are being, you're doing that, and at the same time, you got the president sending crack pipes to our neighborhoods. Hate to Hades with your slogans. And it's time our brothers and sisters stop falling for the symbolism to make, because they, they feel that's all they have to do is make you feel that they're sympathizing with your cause while destroying you. Hell with your, hate to Hades with your t-shirts. No more Black Lives Matter. No more slogans. None of that crap. This is how they pacify you because what? They need you. Your influence allowed them to push their agendas because the Most High say that you will be the one praised in the earth. See? You're the trendsetters. Come on. Thy and, and, yeah, and not just the Judah man. Let me tell you. Kim Kardashian need to break the sisters off and make sure that because everything Kim Kardashian did, what? That's right, folks. Through plastic surgery and through and, and, and all that stuff she did was to pattern herself after what sisters look like naturally. And here it is, our sisters, when it comes to all that, they're on the bottom. But every other nation is looking at them as the trendsetters. They move their hands like the sisters. They're trying to talk like the sisters. Getting butt jobs and all this stuff, stuff that our sisters have naturally because Judah has always been, what, the trendsetters. But we don't, we don't understand the value of how other nations see us naturally. We still see ourselves as slaves off ships, not worth anything, while the other nations are looking at us, looking to brand who we are and what we produce. See? You look at Kim Kardashian before her surgeries. It's as if she took a regular bus of a sister and say, this is what I want. Hook me up. And not once do we ever get any credit for doing what? Teaching the world. Even on the carnal side, they follow us. Right? Come on, let's go. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Read. Verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Who shall rouse up that lion of Judah? Who shall rouse up that lion of Judah? You know who's doing it? Our king, Christ, is doing it. The Most High, through his son, is rousing Judah up. This is why they come with Black Lives Matter, underprivileged people. Uh, stand for racist and uh, this is why you have yeah, this, this is why we have uh, 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 what's his name Eminem taking a knee and I'm like this is all garbage we don't need a knee we don't need symbolism we don't need you, you, you sympathizing with us we don't need your sympathy okay we have what we need Christ Right. We have who we need. Christ. No more pandering. They're using all of this symbolism as a Trojan horse to get in our neighborhoods and, and, and be over all these particular institutions and all these different nonprofit organizations that are destroying our people internally. Read on, Elder Lawyer. Verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. When it says what? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter is what? The staff of the king. 
shall not depart from Judah, read. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Nor a lawgiver between his feet, read. Until Shiloh come. Until who? Until Shiloh come. Until Shiloh comes, with, which means the bloodline, the genealogy of Judah will go from man, from Judah, through David, all the king, Solomon, all the way to Joseph and Christ. A lawgiver between his feet. That's right. That's right, brothers and sisters, and I can prove it. They use two scriptures out of the New Testament to deceive the world into following the goddess Semiramis as the virgin mother. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Shiloh means peaceable one. Now, if you don't believe it's Joseph, go to Matthew and just read the genealogy. Then go to Luke and read the genealogy. Joseph is right there. And then all through the New Testament, I can show you Joseph being from the seed of David. But they use two scriptures to deceive the world into following the goddess Semiramis. Was Mary a virgin? Yes, but it was a virgin according to the what? The Hebrew de definition of it not the virgin we're taught in modern day society. That will also be proven in the academy. Okay. But it's showing you a bloodline from Judah all the way to what? To where Joseph would come in, get with Mary and bring forth Christ. Read. Verse 11, binding his fall unto the vine, and his donkey, his donkey's call unto the choice vine. Now we're going to get that a little later, but, yes, uh, but, but to him shall be what? It says unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Unto him shall be the gathering that the gathering of the people shall be. Now, why did it say that unto him prophetically, unto Christ prophetically, the gathering of the people will be? Why did it say that, folks? Right? But before, I'm going to show you why. Get Deuteronomy 28 and 64. But hold that. And we're going to get Hebrews 7 and 14. Hebrews 7 and 14. Hebrews 7, verse number 14. Read. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Out of what? Out of Judah. Out of who? Out of Judah. Out of Judah. Yahawadah. Christ came from the tribe of Judah through blood, through bloodline. He wasn't a Jew according to religion. So we need to stop this crap. And when, 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 when speaking concerning the history of Israelites, Related to people who who are only that persuasion, if that's possible, through a religion. It is evident that our Lord, our King, sprang out of Judah. Read. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. At what tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood? Because during Moses' time, the priesthood was given to the sons of Aaron, Levi. But Christ would come after the original order of Melchizedek. The, it, and Melchizedek wasn't a man more so than what? A position, king and priest, like Adam was meant to be from the beginning. Noah, king, priest. Shem, king, priest. And eventually, he would do what? Hand the priesthood to Abraham, who would become the new Melchizedek in the earth. And through that bloodline of Abraham, Judah would come, holding the scepter. Yeshia is his name, Christ, after that same order. Right? Read, read that last piece again. Hebrews 7, verse 14. 
For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Out of who? Out of Judah. Out of Judah, read. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Now, why did it state in the Bible? In Genesis 49, prophetically about this man coming, Shiloh. And unto him shall be the gathering that the gathering of the people shall be. Genesis 49. Why did it prophetically state that Christ would gather the people? What people? This is what he was talking about. Elder lawyer, let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Mm -hmm. Let's read it. 28 and 64. Deuteronomy 28, verse 64. Come on. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth, even unto the other. This is why it says unto him shall the gathering of the people be. It was told to Moses that if the Israelites break the law, statutes and commandments given them, that all of these curses shall come upon Israel and overtake Israel. What are those curses? Israel being scattered throughout the earth. That's why it says until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So Christ was prophesied to undo the curse that came with captivity. Serving other nations. Okay. Being scattered throughout the earth, losing our identity. Christ is that prophecy that would gather us back, what? With the knowledge of ourselves being Israelites. Read it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And these are the places that you'll serve under what? False religions, Christianity, Islam. That's why it says wood or stone. Wood represents the, the cross of Talmud, which is the key figure of idolatry within Christianity. The stone represents the Kaaba stone of the Ishmaelites. That leaked, that leans right back to Persian mythology and the and and the what and the workings of magic through th through through the jinns. The jinns would live in what rocks, streams, and any mineral resources that were created from the beginning. So this is what they believe in Persian mythology that there's a jinn or a demon or a genie who grant wishes in the Kaaba stone. This is why they kiss the stone, revered the stone, and made an idol out of a stone. And in order for the Muslims to get any level of credibility concerning kissing rocks, they had to associate that with what? Our forefather, Abraham? Liars. They knew that no one, no one's going to give any credence to some rock. So they got to associate it with our father. Liars. Oh, he built, he built a house at the Kaaba. Where's that history? What date did that happen? Liar. This is what they did to do what? To coerce our people into false religion. The rock. Islam is a, is, is, is a damnable satanic religion, folks. At the surface, when you look at the priesthood and what's behind it, it's evil as I don't know what. But if you think that's bad, Christianity is even worse. Because at least, at least the Muslims, at least the Muslims aren't using Christ's name within the title of their religion. See? So, Folks, what happened to pagan Rome's religion? Where is it? It just disappeared? No, they just kept it going and re and rebranded paganism, Christian paganism. I mean, uh, 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 uh pagan, pagan worships. They just rebranded it. It didn't disappear. They just started calling it Christianity. 
Now, I'm down with the Christianity, which was established before Constantine. Just call us pre-Constantine Christians. But that belief system no longer, no longer exists in the earth. On what? On a mass scale. It's only small pockets in the earth. And this is one of the, the pockets, the Gathering of Christ Church, that went back to what was established before the Romans took it or destroyed it. Finish reading, other lawyer. That last piece, this is why Christ would gather. Read that. Yes, sir. Deuteronomy 28, verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Even wood and stone. And you know what, Elder Lawyer? It's, it's ironic. It's ironic that no one had a problem. There was no people questioning the, the validity of Christ's history. When all of the nations in the earth believed that he looked like this. There was no question whether or not Christ existed in history. When our people believed that he was a white man. Now, let me make it clear. If Christ was a white man, let me make it clear. With all he did in the earth and what was and what he was prophesied to do. I would still believe in him. That's right. If he was a white man, let me make it clear, based on his the prophecies and and what he did for us and and what we he will eventually do for the world mm -hmm. in judgment. I would follow him. That's right. But it so happens he looked like us. There was no problem. There was no question in Christ's validity or history when our people believed that he was a white man. Now, you might think that this is a picture. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. But no, this is an actual art rendition of a man by the name of Cesare Bogier. The second son of Alexander VI, Pope of Rome. He was an Edomite who was placed, that's right, he was placed in the new world predominantly as the new Jesus, as Christ, taught to the North American Indians who are Gadite, taught to the black people here in America who are Judite. And our children were programmed and, and this image was whitewashed, literally whitewashed our minds and to believe in that the Lord that our, that the Lord and Savior that our foreparents uh, that 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 their children can look forward to to save them what was not only a white man folks but when you do the history of this guy this guy was a criminal a poisoner right i want y'all to see this and let, let it resonate that history had no problem with validating Christ when the whole earth thought he was a white man. To, to let you know, folks, how close they're watching you and the awakening. Now they're going to allow the narrative to shift when now we understand that he looked no different than us. Now, so were his disciples. His disciple, get Acts 13. I'm going to say this real quick. Let me say this real quick. And this is why I had to preface my words and preface my statement before showing that picture. Because I know how divisive black and white can be in discussions. Because the world made it where, where what? Blacks and whites, I'm using those words loosely because there's really no such thing as black or white people, but you all know what I'm talking about. I'm using, understand that, understand I'm using this just to state the facts, okay? And usually you can't talk black or white because the political structure was set up to where 
that conversation couldn't be had unless it was something divisive. But no, I'm just bringing it forth. And this is why I preface the fact that if he was a white man, I would still follow him. How do you know, folks? Because we followed him when we thought he was a white man. That's how. His color didn't mean anything to us. We believed in the morality, the doctrine, the spirit to teach the world, an unrighteous world, righteousness, which did what? It transcended. It, it really all together made it where it didn't matter what color he was. He was such a great man. But what happens when we find out he's a black man? Why all of a sudden the other nations cannot accept a black man like we accepted a white man as Christ? What's wrong? We're not the racist here. <laughs> We're not the racist. We, we've accepted him as a white man and, and persevered through his, through his, what his teachings. So we're not the racist. It's the white people who now have an attitude or a problem and believe it's racist that now the Bible scriptures illustrate Christ and has always illustrated Christ as a black man. So was his disciples and the pagan Gentiles who were converting during that time had no problem with learning the gospel from black Israelites who believed in Christ, like Peter, Paul. So we're not the racist. It seems as if a lot of people out there could only will only accept Christ if it does what? Place place their particular race in a in a particular power position to be revered. You can only accept yourself. That's racist. I don't have, we had no problem with Christ being a white man, but he wasn't. This is the criminal that was placed as the new image of Christ from the Borgia family. Okay. His name is Cedric Borgia. Look him up. The image the artificers in Rome at that time, in Italy and different parts of Europe, used as the new image, presto magic, the new Jesus Christ. Now he will be portrayed, what? As an image for Rome. See, we didn't do this. Your people did this. Now let's prove that Christ and his disciples were people of color. Let's get Acts 13 real quick, and then we'll jump into it. Acts 13, verse 1. Come on. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger. That was called what? That was called Niger. That was called Niger. Look at that word Niger. 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 Black in the Greek. Clear. The first teachers of Christ's ministry in Christ's ministry were all black men. And there's nothing wrong with that. And the Gentiles, the whites and the others learned from them. And there was nothing wrong with that. I mean, not from my standpoint, but obviously the Roman Empire had a problem with that. See, they were called Niger. See, these old Southern guys came over to America and they and and they couldn't speak that old way of uh of pronouncing Niger, so they started calling us nigger. A mispronounce what they're really doing is mispronouncing the word which what describes the original Christians. Nigger. Okay. They made it a, direct, a, a derogatory word, but really, they were just stating a fact, not about ignorance or none of the, these other new terms that came up in America, that we were the people of the Bible. Niger. Read it again, Elder Lawyer. Acts 13, verse 1. 
Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger. That was called Niger. So was Christ. Christ was a black man. The, all the Israelites, all the teachers, the Christians in the New Testament were black. Now, let me make it clear. The color of your skin get, gets you a ticket to nowhere. Let me make it clear. Now, when it comes to just stating the facts of who the original teachers are, it doesn't change the fact that if you don't believe in Christ, regardless of your color, you're condemned. Let me make that clear. But I'm just stating the fact that Christ is coming to gather his people because why? It's his people that must become a light to the Gentiles. The Gentiles don't know any better after all of these years worshiping under Babylonian mysticism, which, which is their religious institutions. So if we're waiting for these Gentiles who are Buddhist, uh, modern day Christians or Muslims just to grow a conscience and just snap and change their institutions, folks, don't hold your breath for that. There's nothing that's within their religious institutions that's going to guide them where they need to be. Okay? Straight out. It's our people that's going to lead the charge by speaking to the wind, by bringing forth these scriptures and doing what? Saving a remnant out of these satanic institutions called churches, mosques, temples. Don't wait for the religious institutions and the leaders over them to grow a conscience to actually reform their religious tenets into what Christ was teaching. It'll never happen. See? But what they will do, they'll cherry pick certain parts of the, the moral standards that they know Christ was teaching. And then parallel that with some of the teachings within their religion to say, well, it, there's no difference. That's what they will do. Use Christ to lure you out. See? When there's morality tenets, tenets of morality within our religion. Why? Because Ham, Shem, and Japheth had the Noahid law. They all had what? The seven Noah tenets that Noah gave all of his three sons, which is really the core of all justice systems throughout the earth. So just because a religion can show you something similar to what Christ was teaching doesn't mean it's Christ. You have to weigh their whole religion through the laws of God to understand how short they come up. Right? Now let's go in, Elder Lawyer. Yes, sir. Right? Christ is more than a prophet. Let's go to Matthew 11. So Christ came to gather the Israelites, and he, he's also what? A judge. He's a judge. In Genesis 49, it also tells us who he will judge. A matter of fact, you're the lawyer. The spirit moved me on that, so I got to go there. Let's go back to Genesis 49 and go to Isaiah 63. Genesis 49, verse 11. Binding his fall unto the vine and his donkey's coat unto the choice vine. Okay. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. And he washed his clothes in the what? In the blood of grapes. In the blood of grapes. Now, first of all, it, it prophesied that he is to gather the 12 tribes of Israel, right? The lost sheep. But then in the prophecy from our father, who? Jacob, Yaiqua who name was turned to Israel, Yasha Allah. Our father Israel says that this same man that would come from Judah would do what? It says, 
vine and his foal unto the vine, and his donkey's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments and wine, and his clothes and the blood of grapes. He washed his garment in wine, and his clothes in what? The blood of grapes. The blood of grapes. So what was this prophesying? Hold that and get Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verse 1. Now, what we're reading is from what, folks? The prophets who prophesied what this man would do out of Judah. Read. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments of Bozrah? Who is this? Read. This that is glorious in his apparel. So that means when he return, he'll be glorious in his apparel. Revelations 19 and 11 tell you he's coming with all white. Glorious in his apparel. Read. Traveling in the greatness of his strength. Traveling in the greatness of his strength with the host of heaven. Read. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. That's the identic identifier there. He's what? I that speak in righteousness. He that speaks in righteousness. Mighty to save. Mighty to save. Save. Yesha. Yeshaya is who it's speaking about. So this is Yeshaya going through the capital of Bozrah. Going into Bozrah was the capital city of Edom. So it's talking about sitting amongst those who are planning and planning the destruction of his people in the earth, the legislation. He went amongst all of the leaders of Edom. The movers, the shakers, those who can make a difference in this earth if they wanted to. He went amongst their leaders and found what, Elder Lawyer? It says, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? So the question is, you came white. You came to the earth white, Christ, with white garments. Why are your garments stained red? Read. And thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat. It looks as if your garments is like one who was stomping grapes. Similar to what we're reading in the prophecies of Genesis 49. Read. Verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. He went amongst the head of Esau, who shaped the legislation of this earth, and found that there was not one in a leadership position for him or his people. I don't care what the the government president, uh, the pre presidents are in the earth today. He says he went amongst all of the leaders of Edom and found not one of them was down with him or his people. Read. For I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. And I will stain all my raiment. This is the prophecy of Christ. Genesis 49 of him coming against the Roman Empire eventually. Now that was in the prophets. About five centuries. Before Christ, folks. So what's going on here? The Roman Empire see what was written of him in the Old Testament and was wondering whether or not this child that was born, Joseph and Mary, was the one prophesied to fulfill this particular prophecy, to come in and to destroy the leaders of Edom, who is Rome. And if you don't know it, be there tomorrow when I go into who's Edom. So this is why Horod the Idumean, an Edomite who converted to Judaism during the time of Herodianus, I'm talking about his forefathers, Anatopper, made the Herodian, or, or what you would call the Herod, Herodites 
of tetrarchs that was actually in position during the Roman Empire. This is why Herod the Greek, the Idumean, wanted Christ dead at birth. He was prophesied in the Old Testament to destroy the Roman power. But what Herod and them didn't realize, it wasn't talking about the child destroying them at that time, but they didn't care. It was about the bloodline. If they killed the child, then they can stave off the prophecies of the Israelites, which were against the European or the Romans agendas. See, he was a threat. Not once growing up, Growing up in the churches that they tell us why governments would want to actually preemptively kill the son of God. If he's here to help the whole world and you are a government that's in place to help your citizens and to help your people, why would you push a legislation that that would lead to you killing babies? They never really gave us the insight to that. But now when we read the prophets concerning our king that was prophesied, Christ was born not only to gather Israel, but to judge the empire that has enslaved us. And they know it. They know that's the true purpose, one of many purposes. But these are the two they're focusing on. Our people being gathered as Israelites and the judgment on Edom. Our father, Israel, Jacob told us at his deathbed, the prophecy of each son. And I've read them all, the 12 patriarchs and all that. But in particular, Judah, the significance of Judah and who is Judah in predominantly? It's the blacks in America who came directly off of the slave off of the slave ships. I got proof that one of the first slave ships was called the SS de Judah. That's right. That came to the Americas. Those, because they needed what? They needed that stock of leadership to help build this empire. Folks, that stock that came from what? Planning, calculating, establishing empires on how to orchestrate and organize people. This is what Judah has always done. So they didn't just pull anyone from Africa. It was a certain stock they would need to build Babylon. Folks. So it was prophesied what Christ would do, folks. And hence the reason why like the empires, they are a threat to us prophetically, but we need what's instilled in them spiritually to build our tower. See? <laughs> so it's a love hate relationship the empires has always had with the children of Judah. It's a love hate relationship. They fear what we will, what, what will become prophetically according to the Bible, but they need what the most high have blessed us with to build their empire. See now let's go. Who's Christ? Let's go to Matthew 11 and one elder lawyer. And I said, I had two other scriptures you were holding, right? Or you let those go. I think we are. We cover them? Yes, sir. Okay. Matthew 11 and 1. Let's go. St. Matthew 11, verse 1. And it came to pass when Yeshia had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, when he set up the 12 disciples, because it tells us in Genesis 49 that the scepter shall, shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. Shiloh means peaceable one. And to him shall the gathering of the people be. Right? So obviously it was prophesied through sin that the Israelites would be scattered throughout the earth. 
So Christ's first mission with his disciples is to begin what? Gathering his people, which was foretold to us where? At our father's deathbed in Egypt. During the time of Egypt, before Israel, Jacob died. He sat down all of his sons and said, here's the future. And he said, Judah, unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So Christ would establish a doctrine that would eventually begin to gather the 12 tribes who are scattered in this earth due to sin against their God. That would be a key cornerstone of Christ's doctrine. Let's get it. Matthew 10, 5 and 6, Elder Lawyer. See Matthew chapter 10, verse number 5. Free. These 12, Yeshua sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. So initially, Christ told the Israelites, the disciples, not to go to the Gentiles. Gentiles are what? Non Israelites. Read. Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Come on. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'd rather you go where? But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I would rather you go to the lost sheep of Israel, because Israel, at this point of history, has already been scattered throughout the earth, including the Americas, including the indigenous people of Australia, Central, South, North America, different parts. We're in different parts and provinces outside of Rome. We're scattered all over. So Christ now has begun that prophecy in doctrine to do what? Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go read. And as ye go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And with this statement, Christ our king became a direct threat to Caesar, the Roman Empire. What are you talking about being a king, bringing a kingdom, living under our kingdom. See? <laughs> what are you talking about? So this is the political schism that began. Christ was talking prophetically amongst our people that he was the one prophesied to gather as it was told our forefathers by Israel, by Jacob. Now, there's a political disruption here. The Pharisees and the scribes are making money in position to keep the Israelites in position under Caesar. <laughs> so now there's a political conflict. Matter of fact, let's go there where the Pharisees and scribes came together and say, what will we, what will we do about this man? Because he's talking about toppling Rome and Rome takes care, takes care of us, <laughs> right? Like we can serve God and all that and we can follow law, Moses law, but who's going to take care of us if, if what, if he's the one. So this is why politically it started getting from the surface up into the Sanhedrin and the consuls that led to conversation amongst the Senate of Rome. Because our people were there too. See, it was our people there in position like you have T.D. Jakes, like you have politicians today who you think because they look like you, you vote for them and you look at our communities and that are utterly decimated, that's what you voted for. Okay, this is politics I'm talking about right now. So the Pharisees and scribes and those who claim to believe in a future Messiah who would come, you would think that they would align themselves with Christ. No. Let's read it, Elder Lloyd. St. John 10 and 46. 
But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Yeshia had done. Yep. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. This man do many miracles. Okay. It cannot be denied the impact he is having on our constituents. Right? <laughs> The conversation is being spread amongst the community that this guy can possibly be the one our forefathers prophesied about. He may be the one the prophets were talking about. And if so, why would they follow us? What power can we have if this man is the one that was prophesied to unite Israel? And how would we look not following him? See? So he's like, what are we going to do about this guy? Because it seems like it's rounding out prophetically to him being the one. And I'm not talking about European people and Gentiles, folks. I'm talking about how our political leaders and religious leaders were viewing the uprising, the spiritual uprising that came with Christ's ministry. When they could have just joined with it. Read. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? What are we going to do? For this man doeth many miracles. Man, he's helping people. Come on. If we let him thus alone. If we let him alone. If we just allow him to just operate without interference. All men will believe on him. All the people that are with us will believe on him. Read. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Look at that. And the Romans will come and take away our position over the people. And our nation is doomed. Because believe it or not, these political uh, uh, leaders believed in their mind that them being in position with Rome would preserve the nation of Israel alive because they were in position, right? It's like this. I have to get in the game to change the game. How many times have you heard that? Right? See, we can't do nothing from the outside. I'm going to get in and change it. So they convinced themselves you know, of course, there was payola that came with that, that they could politically offset the prophecies. When in the Bible, in the Torah, in the Tanakh, they were reading Pharisees and scribes. It was prophesied that we would lose Jerusalem. <laughs> it was prophesied that we would lose Jerusalem, but they thought their political positions and their cushy seats could do what? preserve them in their relationships with the Romans and thereby stave the Roman Empire off from destroying the people. Read that last piece again, other lawyer. Yes, sir. Verse number 48. Read it. If we let them thus alone. If we do nothing. All men will believe on him. People are going to start believing. Now, mind you, folks, Christ was doing nothing but good for the people. You would think these people, leaders, would have an interest in doing what? Backing him. <laughs> they got in position claiming to care for the people. Well, here's a man who have cared more so for the people with proof of his works before the people. You would have thought that they would actually join him and say, you know what? Regardless of what the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire isn't giving sight to the blind. They're not having deaf people here. They're not giving speech back to a man. They're not healing people from sicknesses. Christ was only doing good, folks. But what they seen wasn't good. What they seen was a threat to their livelihood. Because the Romans are only going to put money 
invest money into leaders who can control the people for their interests. So they don't care who it is. They, they, you know, if they see the Pharisees aren't influencing people, they're gonna sit in their councils and say, "You think we can? Uh, you think you you think we can we can put Christ on the payroll?" Now, even though Christ would deny it, you think those discussions weren't being had? Well, if you can't control the people, I'll speak to the decide. I'll speak to his men. Esau don't care who it is. Whoever can control the people and show forth interests of Rome in a positive light, they'll hire anyone. <laughs> they don't care your color. So the Pharisees sat around and said, what? Let's read it. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. All men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. We'll lose our jobs with the Romans. And our prestige as politicians and religious leaders amongst the people. We'll become regular. Read. Uh, 49. And one of them named Caiaphas, being high priest, or being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. You know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people. That one man should die for the people is written, and I'm going to show you all that. And that the whole nation perish not. So that the whole nation perish, perish not. And this he spake not of himself. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshia should die for that nation. He prophesied. You know what he said in that council? Y'all know nothing at all. This is the one. This is the one who will die for the nation so that we can be spared and one day gain power again. He's the one. Now, if you and I were in the room, I hope. <laughs> I know if I was in a room, I would have said, you know what? I'm out of this room. I'm out of here. I'm going to find Christ. Okay. If, if y'all know he's the one and still planning to kill him, I'm out of here. <laughs> right. But let's see what steps they took. Read of the lawyer. Yes, sir. Uh, Reading on, it says... Chapter, verse. Uh, uh, John 11 and 53. John 11 and 53. Read it. And not for that nation only, but that he also should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Read that again. And not for that nation only. And not for that nation only. Not for us that, that are here in Judea only. But what? But that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. He will also one day gather the, the tribes of Israel from the northern kingdom that, was, that, that were scattered in 721 B.C. under the Assyrians. Now, folks, I'm reading the New Testament. The Pharisees and scribes, the politicians knew that it was Christ's position to gather all 12 tribes together one day like it once was under King David. This is a physical doctrine aimed towards a physical people. They knew this in the council against Christ. Now look at that. <laughs> so when, when the Romans came to North America, the different parts, they didn't discover anything. They knew exactly who our people were here. But how could they gain, gain what you would call favor politically if they were, tell, if they were reporting back to Italy and reporting back to Spain and Europe that they were killing the actual lost sheep of Israel that they found in the New World? How would that would have played for them? See? So they had to do what? We discovered a new land. And I don't know about these people. They're savages. They're the indigenous people are savages. And we don't know where they came from. Okay. But they need to be civilized. Well, who are they? Well, they're savages. We're going to call them Indians. Okay. 
because that would not have worked for them to go back to Europe and say, you know what? We found the lost sheep of Israel. They had to call us savages to justify doing what? Killing us, colonizing us. See? See? See, if they can take away the name, now they can absolve themselves by saying, I did nothing to the children of Israel. Those were black people I, I, I harmed. Those was Hispanics, black Latinos. They, they coming up with new terms now. They got a new one called black Latinos. They can now absolve themselves by stating, well, technically I didn't do anything to the children of Israel. Okay. Okay. I didn't do nothing to the children of Israel. I mean, they told me that they were, they were African-Americans. Okay. They told me they were Afro-Latinos. I, Israel, Israel, I don't know. The, they, they, they told me they were Puerto Rican. So, you know, I asked. Now, if they were told me they were Israel, yeah, I probably would have treated them differently, but see, read that last piece again of the lawyer. Uh, 53 and not for that nation only but that he also should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad the children of God that were scattered abroad an old prophecy from the time we were in Egypt okay Christ's prophecy as king to gather us and now he's a threat to the Roman Empire now right now Elder Lloyd let's go to Matthew 11 let's get through it you got to take a little break or you good? Real quick. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, we're going to take a small break and come back with part two. Hold tight. The Bible. Is it hard to understand? When it comes to reading the Bible, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that this is the Word of God. The seals have been broken, and the truth is here. And when we go throughout the scriptures, when we go throughout extra biblical records, we find that the language that God employed, that He used to create the heavens and the earth, was the Hebrew language. Christ said, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But yet no one, no religious leader, no religious church out there anywhere can now identify the 12 tribes of Israel. Can we? God is quite simple, but it seems as if man makes understanding him hard. What are those mysteries? The truth of your book. And the truth will make you free. The Hebrew and Bible Academy, you're invited. Okay, all right, part two. 
All right, and as you heard, the Hebrew Bible Academy, we're still taking enrollments. Week four of the Hebrew Bible Academy starts tomorrow, in which a lesson in which we identify who is Edom, Satan's agents, right? When did, that's right, when did the Edomites start practicing Canaanite religion? Okay, the Canaanite religion is the core foundation of modern day Christian churches using Christ's name, but really it's ancient Canaanite Satanism. And I'll be going into that tomorrow. In the Hebrew and Bible Academy, we'll also be going into portals uh, very soon of the gates between heaven and earth. There are stargates. There's, there's also portals in the earth. NASA knows about this, and I'm going to be showing that within the academy. And we're going to go into, again, back by popular demand, you got it, finding the Ark of the Covenant. Not only will we find that, while we're in the wilderness, the Most High will give us the gold that Joseph hid in the sand outside of Egypt. He's going to reveal that back to us. We're going to get that. All of that and more. Okay. Hey, you don't want to miss finding the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. The highest weapon known to man created by the Almighty given to Moses. You, hey, you don't want to miss that. So portals, the gates between heaven and earth. In this academy, all the way broken down, I'm going to show you from the beginning, from Genesis to Revelations, that there are gates between this realm and the other realm, okay? The unseen world. So if this interests you, go to historytimes.org. On top of that, backed by popular demand, <laughs> we can now, you can now download the videos in the academy. Okay, they cannot be uploaded to any other platform or anything like that. But if you are an Academy member, you have the lessons, you can now download them like we used to do so that you can follow the lessons. Even if YouTube or the internet doesn't work or whatever the case is, you still have these lessons to go back to, to build your understanding of the word. Okay, so the downloads are now available and we'll be doing that in future Academies. It would be the most highs will. Now, let's jump right in, part two. Go to historytimes.org to enroll. You can still get in and we'll make sure you get the, the past three lessons, the prior lessons. Let's go, Matthew 11, other lawyer. Matthew 11, verse one. Come on. And it came to pass when Yeshua had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, when John had heard in prison, the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Yeshia answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do he, uh, see and hear. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, Whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Yeshia began to say unto the multitude concerning John, What went ye out to see in the wilderness, or what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea. I say unto you, and more than a prophet. And what? And more than a prophet. He says, what did you go out to see? A prophet? No. More than a prophet. See? And this is why, let me tell you, these people in Islam who's pushing that religion, they need to get out of here with that. Right? They go straight into trying to validate their belief by citing Israelite prophets. Oh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
He was a prophet. Moses was a prophet. Abraham was a prophet. Moses was a prophet. And Christ was a prophet. Hold up. One of these things doesn't belong here. You know that old Sesame Street thing. One of these things doesn't belong. So you, you just cited all those from the bloodline of Israel and just threw an Ishmaelite up in there. And even in the Quran, it tells us that prophethood was given to the prophethood was given to the progeny of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So there's no such thing as an Ish Ishmaelite or an Arab prophet. Okay? So they try to minimize this crisis power by putting him on the level or bringing him down to the level of an Arab who wasn't even prophesied within with, within the Hebrew prophets. More than a prophet. He's king. Was he a prophet? Of course he was. Did he fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament? The, the Old Testament? Of course he did. But he was more than a prophet. And see, and this is one thing that you can't say that any other prophet was in this earth. That you would try to state claim or try to hold them up to some level of, of, of royalty. I mean, some level of prestige or relevance. None of the prophets you're talking about was prophesied to be king. <laughs> None of the prophets you're talking about was prophesied to gather the 12 lost tribes of Israel and establish a king for them. See? He's more than our prophet. And it's a shame that, the, that Christian church have downplayed Christ's full mission. They made him out as some Gandhi type figure. <laughs> okay. Give me a break. Christ is coming back for serious takedown and war against the evildoers of this earth. Just like his father, he's a man of war. Okay. Understand. Understand what, we, what we're going into here, folks. Christ, y'all see the title, is more than a prophet and was more than a prophet. He's king. Finish reading, other lawyer, that, that last piece. Uh, verse 7. And as they departed, Yeshia began to say unto them, or unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out to see, or what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. I say unto you, and more than a prophet. More than a prophet. He's king. He's savior. Okay? He will establish a government. And I'm going to go into that in a moment. And what we're doing in the earth gives us entry or position within that government. Okay? Now, you may not believe in him, but the Romans sure do. If the Rome, and not only that, the history of them, Herod, the history of him attempting to go after Christ is documented also in the annals of Rome. Because it was the Israelites who were under the Roman Empire who was seeking a king outside of Caesar. See? In the annals of Rome, it also recorded Herod, who, who did what? Try to set up mercenaries to find the child. But you don't believe in it. You're questioning his existence, but yet throughout history, the Roman empires, the Druids and, and their, their omen seekers, as well as their politicians work together to try to figure out when would this child come into the earth? 
who would oppose the future governments of the earth. And if we allow him to survive, we'll subdue the governments of the earth. You don't have to believe in him, but the political structure is set up and have been set up to go against him and his people. Whether you believe in him or not, the governments do. Okay. Elder Lawyer. Now, let's go to the, the, the prophecy of the Old Testament. Isaiah 53. Hold that and get John 1 and 7. John, hold John the first chapter. And John the 12th chapter. Right? Mm -hmm. And before you go there, Christ had two separate ministries set up. He had two separate ministries. He had a ministry that was established with Peter that was aimed towards more so those who knew they were Israel in Judea, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. This would establish the first church that would have the doctrine, listen to me clearly, the doctrine established to find their brothers. To find our family who was scattered. So he set up Judah. Peter. To establish a doctrine that would do what? Go forth over the waters into remote areas to say he he who was prophesied has come and has atoned for our forefathers' sins. Find your brothers. Let them know the prophecy of atonement has been fulfilled and one day they will have the original place lost before sin. Now you would think every Christian church would have, have that doctrine that I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel for the circumcision. But they don't. They'll dismiss that and say, it doesn't matter if you believe in Israel, you're spiritual Israelites. Huh? So Christ had two separate ministries, one under Peter and another under Paul. And another under Paul. Paul would do what? Paul would go out and teach the Gentiles, the non-Israelites, the prophecy concerning a government that's coming where the Gentiles will have a part in an obedient part of servitude. If they were to renounce paganism on top of that, Paul had another part of the ministry of the Gentile. Not only would he teach the natural Gentiles, which are other races of people outside of Israelites, he would also find the children of Israel who were scattered amongst the Gentiles who have no idea that they are Israelites and give them back their what? Their lost culture, tradition, and law. Because the Gentiles started teaching our people who were scattered that they were Gentiles. So Paul had a dual mission. Teach the natural Gentiles and the Israelites who are scattered amongst them, who think they're Gentiles. Let's get that in Galatian real quick. Galatians 2 and 6. And this is the scripture, the precept, which confirms that. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, the most high except of no man's person. Come on. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Come on. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So Paul said what? That the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me. As was what? As the gospel of the circumcision. So there's two gospels that was divided between the two men. A good news for who? The circumcision, the circumcision are those who are practicing 
circumcision. These are they who knew they were Israelites. Like the disciples knew they were Israelites. Read. And uh, it says, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Like the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter. So the uncircumcision was, was committed to Paul. And the circumcision, let me correct that. And the circumcision was committed to Peter. Two separate gospels. So Paul not only taught what? Gentiles who were natural Gentiles. He also taught what? Israelites who were scattered amongst the nations who thought they were Gentiles like our people in America, like us in America, who are children of slaves and were taught that we were Hamites. Paul would come in and say, well, no, you're not Hamites. Deuteronomy 28 tells us that you are from this particular tribe that came out of Africa, who ran into Africa before that prior, who are from the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, Levi, See, he would teach the history of Israelites to gain Israelites who thought they were Gentiles back to the fold. Another way in which Christ is gathering according to prophecy, those that are scattered. So there's two types of Gentiles, natural Gentiles and the Gentiles who are what? Israelites. Now here's the problem. They're not teaching in Christianity who those Gentiles are that Paul went to. They'll make everyone believe, they'll convolute it by making you believe that all these Gentiles Paul is teaching are what? Natural Gentiles, not differentiating between the two. There's Israelites who think they're Gentiles. That's another form of Gentile that they're not teaching. Israelites, some Israelites are convoluting the waters because they'll go what? To the direct contrast of what the Christians are doing. Still in the era, still in error. They'll now say all of the Gentiles Paul was teaching were Israelites, making the same mistake as the Christians who are claiming that all of the Gentiles that Paul taught were non-Israelites. <laughs> all right. So how do you differentiate from the two? Well, I'll show you. I'll show you. Real quick before breaking down Isaiah 53, other lawyer. You have something in particular? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Let's do it real quick. Because we are, we are pressed against the time. Let's go real quick. Let's go real quick to Hosea 8 and 8 in the Old Testament. And Hosea 9 and 17. In the Old Testament, let's go to the book of Hosea. 8 and 8. And Hosea 9 and 17. Hosea 8 verse 8. Yeah. Israel is swallowed up. Israel is swallowed up. Now, these are physical Israelites. Read. Now shall they be among the Gentiles. They shall be what? Among the Gentiles. So now when Israelites were scattered, they were among the Gentiles and learned of other gods, wood and stone, idols and all those things. Read. As a vessel wherein is no pleasure. As a vessel wherein there is no pleasure. They will always be, they'll always uh, it, be treated as second class citizens fighting for equal rights. They're the bottom of the barrel of any empire because why? These are people without a home. There is no place for them. So they'll always be complaining about what? Injustice, inequality, right? It says they were scattered amongst the Gentiles. The Gentiles' interests are for their people, right? So it's telling you the Israelites are going to be a vessel wherein there's no pleasure. Every place they're scattered, they'll realize what? There is no comfort. We aren't home. This is this. My condition and position is not what God intended for us long term. We'll understand that. Right. 
Let's get Hosea 9 and 17. Read it. Hosea 9 verse 17. My God will cast them away. My God will cast them away. Because they did not hearken unto him. Because we didn't listen to the laws given to Moses. Read. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. They shall be wanderers among the nations. They shall be wandering among the Gentiles. So if you're wandering amongst the Gentiles, through time you will lose the knowledge of being an Israelite and to start to believe you are the people who've enslaved you or whatever title they placed on you. You'll begin to embrace. So Paul had a serious job to do. It's one thing teaching the Gentiles to renounce their paganism. It's another thing teaching a people that there are an entirely different people in which they were re uh, uh, entirely different people from who they was raised to believe they were. <laughs> so Paul had a job to do. It wasn't just to the natural Gentiles, but to the Israelites who was wanderers amongst the nations. See, to fulfill the prophecy of Christ gathering the 12 tribes, the lost sheep of Israel, which was really the true gospel. That's the true mission to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the true gospel folks. All right. Is that clear? Now, elder lawyer. Let's go to a uh, first Corinthians 12 and two. Well, let me make sure. Yeah. First Corinthians 12, one and two, just, I'm going to give you an example real quick of how Paul was able to differentiate natural Gentiles from who? From Israelites who are in a Gentile state of mind. Let's get uh first Corinthians 12 and one. Let's read it. Yes, sir. First Corinthians 12 verse one. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. I would ha not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles. You know that you were. What? You know that you were Gentiles. So how do you know that Paul is speaking to Israelites right here? A Gentile isn't going to be a Gentile today and another people Israelites tomorrow. Right? It says, I know that you were Gentiles. So obviously these are the Israelites who were scattered amongst the Gentiles and became wanderers amongst the nations and began to practice idolatry. Read it again. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Even as ye were led. Now who was led to worship dumb idols? The Gentiles were already worshiping dumb idols. <laughs> so now you can go into the Bible and see when Paul is speaking specifically to Israelites and turning them back to the original way, which is what you got it. The gospel to the Israelites, the same way we'll speak to our people in the neighborhoods and say, no, you're not Muslim. That's bad news. You were scattered amongst the Gentiles and was taught to pray towards a rock. You are an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. That's the same way Paul was dealing back then. <laughs> right? You were Gentile believing you were black or Muslim or up un under some Arab belief that, that, that have destroyed and eroded our communities. The more temples and mosques churches are built, the worse the community becomes, right? So this is how you do it. You take the Israelites out of what, of what a Gentile state of mind. And, and then it'll be like, well, where's my place then? If I can't look at Muhammad as my prophet, if I can't, at least I have the middle East to have some level of a uh, self pride when it comes to culture in a way of life, what is my existence? If I'm going to, 
you know, renounce Islam or Christianity. Christ is your king. See? We, he have sent us through the spirit. Through the spirit to speak to our people to say, listen, our king will soon return. You don't have to cleave to the Gentile powers and, and, and the Gentile way of life to have any self-worth or self-pride in this earth amongst your people. No. You are no longer a Gentile. Let go of the, the idol. Our king has sent us. Have sent us. He will gather us again. His government is not of this world. He's bringing our government back with him. And this is what Paul was showing. Because some of us attach ourselves so to these religions to a degree where we begin to defend them. We'll feel that if we really, if, if we relinquish this religion, then what's to say when it comes to my belief and, and, and what I've taught other people and what it, it becomes a sense of pride and a way of life that we begin to protect and defend. When our government, our king is not of this world. So I wanted to show real quick, you go here to show ye were Gentiles, right? Now in the, in the mind, you know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols. Carried away unto these dumb idols. Now, our people, Israelites, were carried away to worship dumb idols because it was prophesied in Deuteronomy 28 and 64 that the Israelites will be scattered throughout the full corner of the earth and begin to what? Worship wood and stone. These were Israelites here that are called Gentiles. Right? Let's go to Ephesians. 2 and 11. Let's set that straight too. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 11. Yep. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles. Now listen to what Paul says in Ephesus. I, I think we're going to break open some serious understanding for you now. Because we were taught in the Christian church that Paul was only going to what? That he was going to Gentiles or non-Israelites. But no, he did go to them and teach them, but he also distinguished when he was going to Israelites that were in a Gentile state of mind. He made a difference. He announced when he was speaking to Israelites in a Gentile state of mind. Read that again. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past and Gentiles. And what? And what? In time past. In time past Gentiles. See? <laughs> so when it talks about uh, 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 our upbringing and the false teachings of the Gentiles, Paul is now highlighting, in fact, that he's speaking to Israelites here. Because a Gentile is not going to be a Gentile today and something else the next day. They're still Gentile, even if they believe in Christ. You know that ye were Gentiles, read. In the flesh. In the flesh. Who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. So you were called uncircumcised by your own people. When it says in the flesh, their actions in the flesh were, were, were what? Unclean, uncircumcised, against the law. To a degree where their own people the Jews, Judah, Benjamin, Levi, began to call their own family by blood, heathen, Gentile. Read. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Gentiles in the flesh. Uh, uh, heathenistic actions. Who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision Come in on. the flesh made by hands. Come on. That at that time you were without Christ. At that time before Paul ran into you, ye were without Christ. Read. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Being aliens from where? Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. They were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Brothers and sisters, you cannot be alienated from something 
you weren't originally a part of. The Gentiles were never a part of the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is the state. <laughs> so now Paul is highlighting when he's speaking to an Israelite that was cursed or scattered learning under Gentile temples and religions. Read. It says, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. And, and they became strangers from the covenant of promises. This is not speaking of Gentiles here. This is speaking of Israelites. Read. It says, having no hope and without God in the world. Come on. But now in Christ, and now in Yeshua the Christ, ye who are sometimes far off. Hold up. All the time. You who are sometimes far off. You who were sometimes afar off. Listen, there was no time in the Old Testament where the Gentiles were sometimes afar off. They weren't in the picture at all. Read. But now in Christ, Yeshua or Yeshua the Christ, ye who are sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. We can come back under the covenant now through Christ's blood. Read. For he is our peace who have made both. He, he is our what? For he is our peace. For he is our peace. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Peaceable one. And unto him the gathering of the people shall be. This is Paul extending the gospel to find his people who are scattered Israelites here read for he is our peace who have made both one and who have made both one. Now, why does it say who have made both one? The kingdom was split after the Solomon of um, the sin of Solomon, where the Southern kingdom of Judea, was separated from the northern kingdom between Rabban and Jarbon, and there was a split between Israel. That have did what? It says, For he is our peace who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. The middle wall of partition was, is between the northern and southern kingdom of Israel. They're lying in the Christian church and tell you that the middle wall partition is between the natural Israelites and the Gentiles to convolute the gospel, to lie, to bring forth a false doctrine. The middle wall of partition is between Israel and Judah, the Northern and Southern kingdom that was split in 721 BC. Now Paul is coming to help Unite the 12 tribes back through the gospel here. Read. Having abolished, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself twain one new man. One new man. So making peace. So making peace because God was at war with the 12 tribes for disobedience. He broke down that middle wall of partition that would bring the 12 tribes back together, which is really the foundation of the true mission and gospel and the gospel of Christ that was given to Paul and Peter, Peter and Paul. See that it's crystal clear, right? But then we would ask, well, what about our King when it comes to the Gentiles? Elder Lord, let's get Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19, yeah. 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations. So Christ said, go teach all nations, all races of people. So this is not saying that Christ is against the Gentile nations who believe in him. He's given what opportunity to every man on earth, every woman on earth to receive him as king. Okay. The king also ruled over the provinces of Gentiles on the outside of his dominion. Mm -hmm. He's still king. So for people to say that Gentiles have no place, they're ignorant to the gospel. <laughs> 
The king rules, rules over his subjects also. His subjects here will be the Gentiles. Read. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Read. Teaching them to observe all things. Which so, so here it is. If you don't teach Gentiles, you are anti-Christ. Because the, Christ commanded us upon his resurrection to teach all nations. It's totally ignorant not to teach all nations, nor that the Israelites are scattered amongst them all. So you are judge according to the appearance, thinking you're teaching an Edomite or a Hamite when, when you can very well be turning away your own bloodline without knowing. We've been scattered anywhere. He didn't make us the decider on who to teach. Mm -hmm. That's right. He sent us to teach the world. And those who would receive him, Christ gives entry into his kingdom. Those who would believe in him, Christ gives entry. It's not up to us to stand in the way and check gene gene uh, genealogical cards to know whether or not what family you're from. That's off. He says, teach all nations. Mm -hmm. Now, what now? now, now what the, what the individual does with that gift is on them. But our job is done. But there's some foolishness out there where people are talking about, you're not supposed to be teaching Gentiles. How, that's, man, listen, that's idiotic. Hold on. That's idiotic. This is what Christ said. This is what Christ said. Go out and do what? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach all races of people. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Because why? All nations will be under his rule anyway. And we must do what? We must teach the world in preparation for our king's government. Mm -hmm. Where, their place, what will they do within this kingdom? The teaching starts now. It doesn't start when Christ comes and then he starts just putting people in place. He put in, he placed teachers in the earth to do exactly what the disciples were doing. Not to make up some new rules about how you feel personally you know, based on the plight of your of, of racism done against you, then now you can change Christ's doctrine. That's wrong. So any Israelite out there teaching that you're not supposed to be teaching other nations are anti-Christ. Because Christ said do it. Let's read it again. Mm -hmm. Do I can mention real quick, that's the key point. You mentioned his kingdom, not our kingdom, his kingdom. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Exactly. And it's through him that we obtain the kingdom if we're found worthy. Exactly. Period. It's not our decision when it comes to Christ's mission. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and, and, and this is what they'll do. They'll try to shame you. And to disobey in Christ's mission. Mm -hmm. They'll try to shame you. Oh yeah, you you yeah, you're just the one who who's pandering to white people and you're doing this. And you know why they're doing that? That's total misdirection off of off of their anti-Christ doctrine. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with white people. It has nothing to do with how I personally feel or you personally feel. What did Christ say do? So you have to watch the misdirection because the shaming makes it personal to where you to where they'll escape. Okay, 
they, they'll try to escape and move the conversation someplace else by using misdirection by shaming or making you feel you're less than or make you feel that you're not teaching your people while teaching the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. That's another thing they'll do. Our people are always down. We're dealing with all this and here it is. You worried about them. <laughs> See, you got to watch that. All of that is emotional instability in these teachers. If I, if I'm teaching all nations, how am I excluding Israelites? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So watch, watch their wordplay. They're really good at misdirecting and try to make you feel a t certain type of way about when it comes to you helping others. This is not my gospel to decide who goes into the kingdom. It's crisis. So watch these people try to shame you. Man, I wish I would sit next down to a white man, blah, blah, blah. Listen, if you come into a church, there's many seats. <laughs> right? It's like anybody going to pack you in a room and say, listen, there's one seat left next to a white guy and you're forced to sit there. <laughs> it's like these people are insane. But really, it's really, in a nutshell, insecure, a spiritual insecurity. You have to get over that. When it, when it comes to teaching the gospel, it's not what you feel personally with what was done against our people. You're teaching the gospel to deliver our people who are oppressed by the Gentiles and deliver those Gentiles who, who are and will be in position to be subjects under Christ's kingdom. That's our job. It isn't personal. Finish reading what you have, Brother Lawyer. Yes, sir. Verse 20, teaching them to observe whatsoever, uh, whatsoever I have commanded you. Thank you. And lo. Hold up, what, whatsoever what? Whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, why did he say whatsoever I commanded you? The door is closed on your personal understanding concerning how to convey the gospel. The door is closed on that. Or how you feel about other people. That should not dictate the command given by our king. Whether you like a race of people or not. It has nothing to do with that. How you personally feel and what personally happened to you. When you come into the gospel and become a leader to, to actually expound on the word, to gather God's people, this command isn't based on what? Your life experience. It's based on now the position you're in to do what? Be an ambassador for Christ's kingdom. To convey the gospel, and at that point, he'll take it up. If a Gentile don't want to do right, guess what? That Gentile is going to be judged. If an Israelite don't, don't do right with the gift that's given through the Holy Spirit in baptism, guess what? He don't do what's right by Christ, he'll be judged. She'll be judged. Mm -hmm. It's not my position to look at you and say, okay, let, let me get your race card. Or you Chinese or who's, who, who's your daddy? Uh, 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 it's utterly insane. Right. Endless. It's endless. Endless genealogies, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. Let's read it teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world. Even unto the end of the world. What is Christ saying? Listen, in the invisible, I'm going into the heavens to shed my blood on, on the heavenly tables. But guess what, folks? What, what is Christ saying? I'm not going nowhere. Throughout all generations, I'm with you. Do this. I'm ruling from the throne, yet present. Where two or more gathered, I'll be there. You may not see me, I'm there. <laughs> Throughout all generations, if you hold this gospel, I'll back it. And, and guess what? Everything. Everything, brothers and sisters, when he, he told Peter, 
If you bound it on earth, it will be bound in heaven. If you do this gospel I'm giving, giving to you, whatever you do here, I'm going to back it up with the angels. You, you, you will have spiritual help. See? And then, I mean, can you imagine setting up a, a doctrine of Christ to bring Israelites who think they're Gentiles and all that back to Christ? And your doctrine is, I'm not going to teach people. I'm not going to teach the white man because we were hung on trees. Hey, okay. What scripture is that? Man, I wish I would teach a Chinese man. You know what I mean? They had us in the dungeons and basements. You know, in, 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 in Singapore, in different parts of China. You see what happened with COVID when they put the black people out and blamed everything on black people. I wish I would teach a Chinese man. Okay. What scripture is that? Mm -hmm. It seemed like you need to step down to get your personal issues together first. Then step to the plate to teach the gospel of Christ. Okay. The gospel of Christ is to all. There was a gospel to the Jews and also the Israelites and also to the Gentiles through Paul. Now it comes with what? That's right, folks. The gospel of the Gentiles comes with accountability. If a Gentile accepts the gospel and belief of Christ and accept Christ as their king, guess what? That's right. It comes with accountability once you take that on. Okay? The same way when our people receive the law, there were do's and don'ts. Well, there's rules if a Gentile choose to, you know, choose Christ. And I'm going to go there later. Elder Lawyer. Now, let's go directly to Isaiah 53. There's rules. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who have believed our report? Who have believed our report? Now, the, the, now, the prophets in the Old Testament reported, reported concerning Christ's prophecies. What he would do once born that would lead to what? Delivering Israel's, Israel's sin, delivering us from sin through a sacrifice. There was a report. The same time the Israelites were falling, a report was being made on how the Most High would restore us back under our king. Now, this is amongst our people. Who will believe that report? What report, Elder Lawyer? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? To whom? Read. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He have no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. There is no beauty that he, that we shall desire him. Now hold that report and let's go to Paul real quick. Romans 10, 16 and 17. Just, you know, just to show brothers and sisters that what was written in the Old Testament was actually upheld, read and was followed not just through the disciples, but through Paul also. Because the Christians will make you believe that Paul just dealt with Gentiles under a lie that they teach in the Christian churches the theologically that all of the Israelites did away, I mean, uh, rejected Christ. And by that, by default, Christ just chose Gentiles as his people. What a lie. What a lie. All of the Israelites didn't reject Christ and he didn't pick up the Gentiles to replace them. These are all lies. And this is what Paul calls boasting against the natural branches. 
Let's read Romans 10, 16, and 17 of the lawyer. Romans 10 and 16. Yes. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Read. For Isaiah saith. For Isaiah saith. Lord, who have believed our report? Who have believed our report? Read. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, where was Paul quoting from? Oh, stay where you at because they got to read that last piece again. Mm -hmm. Where was Paul reading from? Isaiah 53. His letters to the church. So obviously those in the church were reading out of the Old Testament. About a report concerning what? The gospel, the report on this man who was prophesied to gather Israel. Read. But verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who have believed our report? Who have believed our report? Read. So then faith cometh not by here or so then faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And hearing by the word of God. To understand the true mission of Paul, Peter, the disciples, you must understand the prophets and hear and understand it in its context. Read. But I say, have they not all heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? Did not who? Did not Israel know? Did not Israel know? This is Paul. Did not Israel know? They'll make you think that Israelites is something that just popped up from the internet. We're the people, folks. Read. Did not Israel know? For Moses, or first, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. This is Paul quoting Deuteronomy. This is 32, 18 through 21 here. That I would do what? I will provoke them to jealousy by them that are no people. I will provoke them to jealousy by with them that are no people. And by a foolish nation will I anger you. And with a foolish nation I will anger you. So Christ, so Paul knew about the Israelites doing what? Sinning against God and the judgment for it. And he was teaching it in the church that the foolish nation that's in power now was prophesied to be over the children of Israel. <laughs> I, and you know, the Christian churches conveniently, conveniently left that out when they, when speaking of Paul, they would make you believe that Paul popped up later to actually undo everything Christ was teaching. So they'll go straight to Paul, not understanding Christ. When you are supposed to filter Paul's writings through the King, not the other way around. Not filter the king's words through a student. <laughs> through a disciple. See? Come on. Verse 20. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of, of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, All the day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. See that? Now Paul is scorning our people for being what? Stiff-necked, hard-headed. But you know what? He still had to deliver the gospel to them nonetheless. The same way our people today, they're hard-headed. The biggest resistance we'll get, the greatest resistance we'll get, is not with Gentiles against us, but our own people. But you know what? We have to deliver the word anyway. No different. Because why? It's, it isn't personal. It's our jobs. Regardless of what people does or, or, or try to speak against us, gainsay or whatever, the disciples went through the same. The prophets went through the same. But you know what? If one person hear the gospel and convert, our jobs are done. That's the whole point. It isn't personal. And you have so many people out there who've dealt with personal issues and see how we're treated like second class citizens 
and have now merged your personal feelings with how you feel you as a person need to direct the gospel of Christ. That's wrong. That's wrong. And th this is why Christ said in order for you to come to him, in order for you to do his gospel, his understanding, to, to teach his truth, you must be born again. So what happened to you in the past and all that, that person is supposed to die in the water so that you can come up in newness of spirit with, with who? With Christ's mission, not with what you dealt with in the past or what other races are doing in all these things. No, nah, there's a bigger mission for those who deliver the gospel. You're preparing the whole world for our king's government. Okay? You're not just caught up on the racial thing. And guess what? I'm not saying ignore the racial component because yet it exists, but you cannot teach the gospel through it. <laughs> you understand the gospel is good news that means if I'm speaking to an Israelite I have to let them know the good news that comes with Christ's promise mm -hmm. for the Israelites if they repent and then there's good news to the uncircumcision the Gentiles who's going to join something without understanding the benefit of it which is Christ's kingdom and I'm not talking about a church. Who's going to join Christ's kingdom without knowing the benefit for them personally? So I must produce that to the Gentiles and show this is what Christ says is for you if you renounce or denounce your religion and paganism, the strangling of animals, which is strangling of blood and sacrificing that they do in these Catholic churches and these Muslim religions. You must renounce all of that, including the holy days, and follow the true God of Israel. Well, they're going to say, well, what is in it? What, 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 what's in it for me? You have to have the information to convey that. It's not your kingdom. This is what Christ says you get for that. Okay? This is what you get. You will be spared to do what? Live in Christ's kingdom for a thousand years. You'll serve, but you're serving in your empire and getting nothing anyway. What you getting here? You'll have health and your youthful body for a thousand years as a Gentile. There'll be no death there. Mm -hmm. If someone guaranteed you to live a minimum of a thousand years with no death, no pain, no nothing. And once a year you go to Jerusalem to eat from the tree of the good, of uh, the, the tree of life, which will nourish your body, the fountain of youth given to you. <laughs> I mean, what Gentile isn't going to sign up for that? But that's the good parts that a lot of people are leaving out. The only time the person have hatred in their heart, they're going to find scriptures to justify it. And the only thing they're going to show, we're going to beat y'all. You going into slavery. You're this, that, and the other. Because you're teaching through your biased heart. Okay? You're not going to do nothing to no Gentile or anybody else because based on your views of Christ's kingdom, you won't be there. You're not going to make it there because you want to be, you want, you, you want to do to the Gentiles what you're complaining about concerning how the white man treated us. This is, this is what you feel in your heart, you know, is kingdom kingdom in your heart is payback and vengeance when vengeance is the Lord's. Here it is, you complain it about what the Gentiles do, but you, you, you'll you feel some resolve or peace if, if the things we complain about happens to other people. That's, that's wicked and inhumane. Only thing you're supposed to do is deliver the gospel. Okay? That's right. 
Let's go back. Isaiah 63. Uh, Isaiah 53, verse... And listen, I'm not saying... Listen, even Christ says, the nation, who, the nation that will not serve me will die. Right. But who said that? Christ. Mm -hmm. The nation that will not serve the, the, me. The, <laughs> thank you. The nation that will not serve me. Right. That's what he said. He, he's going to judge all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here it is you got people who found all the bad stuff that was going to happen to the Gentiles and made that the, the key points of delivering Christ's gospel with no balance that's evil what about those Gentiles who want to serve Christ who, who, who choose to serve him mm -hmm. let's read it other way let's go yes, to sir. Isaiah yes sir Verse two, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He have no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Come on. He is despised and rejected of men. He's despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. We hid as it was our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. We, he was a spouse. He was he was esteemed. Read it. He was despised. He was despised. And read. we esteemed him not. And we esteemed him not. When it says despised, when you go to 49 and 7, let's go to Isaiah 49 and 7. Isaiah 49 verse 7. Yes. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to whom the nations abhorreth. Man despise and the nations hate him. Why? He's the destroyer of idols. He's the destroyer of all pagan temples and Gentile beliefs. This is why they hate them. Hate him. See? All the religions in the earth are false. See? They're all false. So they hate him because Christ shine a light on the darkness that are within these religions. That the child sacrifice, the human trafficking, the child sacrifice to Moloch, which is what? A requirement within Gentile religions hidden from the masses. Christ shines a light on that. Hence the reason why Christians would like you to read the New Testament. They don't want Christian, the, the, the Christian power very rarely want those who are learning to, to actually read the Old Testament. Because when you read the Old Testament, you'll understand how close these religions we think are right are really Satan's temples. Satan's temples. So the Gentiles despise Christ because what comes with Christ? The light. He shines a light on the practices within these religions. And then when you go into the Old Testament, you'd be like, well, hold up. That sounds like Babylonian worship. That sounds like child sacrifice. That sounds like people getting trafficking, not just for money, but through but under an religious sense. See? So they hate Christ because Christ identifies the darkness of all religions. Read it. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to whom man despiseth, to whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes shall worship, because the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. And he shall choose thee. Let's go back to Isaiah 63. 53. Isaiah 53, verse number four. Surely he have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Come on. Verse number five. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our sins. Mm -hmm. Read. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was bruised for our sins, our iniquities. And this is why uh, Isaiah started the chapter off with, who shall believe our report? 
because down the line, there will be questions on who Isaiah actually speaking about right here. That's why you got some Israelites will look at this who don't believe in Christ and, and be totally off concerning the report. Oh, this can't be Christ. So why must you convince yourself it isn't Christ? Because you don't believe in him. You don't believe in him, right? And guess what? I, brothers and sisters, I've caught people up even while teaching on the street the same way. So you don't believe this is Christ, this report. I will go straight here to those, even Jews who would come under Judaism. And I would ask, who is this report about? They would say, it ain't Jesus. I'm like, so you don't believe that it's Jesus, right? It's like, well, no, I don't believe it's Jesus. You don't believe the report. Okay. And this is why Isaiah says, to whom? Mm -hmm. To whom will believe the report? This conversation isn't for you. That's right. Because I believe it. See, and this is the whole thing, brothers and sisters. Stop arguing nonsense. The Most High says, I mean, it tell you in, in, in the epistles that you must avoid foolish questions and things that gender strife. It's framed within the verse itself that everyone wasn't going to believe the report. Mm -hmm. hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so why argue with a person who's obviously when you read the whole chapter, there's only one man in the same Bible who fulfills all the prophecies that are within the chapter. Only one man. So I, I, I now if it was just one prophecy, I can see someone arguing the report. But there's only one man in the Bible who fulfilled it all. All the prophecies in Isaiah 53, only one man in the Bible fulfilled those prophecies. I can go through all of them. So if you don't believe that report after all the prophecies concerning only one man that relates to them, how can I convince you to believe in Christ? You don't believe in Moses. You don't believe in the prophets. Mm -hmm. Because they wrote of him. You'd rather believe that it's a person that you need that that didn't that wasn't born yet than accept Christ. But it's okay. Hey. It's okay. Because Christ's kingdom will soon be amongst man. So whether you believe it, believe in him or not, and this is all people. Whether you believe he's our king or not, you will be judged by him. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> so you'll believe at the end anyway. See? Let's read it other way. Yes, sir. Just one quick point. Uh, verses four and five. It says, surely he have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken. When we saw Christ suffering and being punished, we thought it was something he did against the Most High and something he did against the law. But verse 5 says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. It wasn't something he did. It was something we did. Exactly. We sinned against the laws of Moses and were scattered amongst the Gentiles. So he had to come to be that lamb that was prophesied that lamb to be crucified, to shed his blood on the heavenly tables for the sin of the nation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and with that, that will be the teachings amongst the disciples gospel. That's right. That we as a people weren't destined to be under the Gentiles and learn under them forever. Christ's blood has been shed for the sins of our nation. See, come on. Verse five, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Hold that and get Matthew 20 and 38. He was wounded for our transgressions. Come on. I said 20 and eight. Uh, uh, 20 and 38. 20 and 38. Yes. Uh, say Matthew 20 and 38. Yeah, yeah. It's only up to 34. Okay, one second. 
It could be 18. Let me get it here. One moment. One second. Let me get it here. Matthew 20 and 28. I'm sorry. 20 and 28. Yes, sir. Say Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Yep. Even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. To give his life as a what? A ransom for many. A ransom for many. You know how it is. Someone being held hostage and in order to recoup that person. To deliver that person or people, those who, who have the power, requires what? A ransom. I'll release them if you pay this. While our people were scattered throughout the four corners of the earth, destined for captivity according to the prophecies. And Christ is the payment to release us from Rome. And this is why they wanted Christ dead. They understood that it was in the prophecies that yes, the Edomites, the Europeans would rule for a time, but eventually the same people that they have enslaved would be released first mentally to be utilized by Christ to do what? To teach and to free others. That we will be, we were bought by Christ's blood, and through that, the information came. The truth came concerning ourselves. Christ paid for that. The truth we're hearing to be free to follow God's law is why his blood was shed so that we can do what? Have knowledge of our true purpose, culture, and nation. His death, his blood paid a ransom in heaven. So that we could do what? State claim to our original place as God's people. Read. Let's go back. Yes, sir. Uh, Isaiah 53, verse number, uh, the, the middle of verse 5. Yep. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. When they was beating him with the cat nine tails and all those things and spitting on him and doing things against him. See, it, it wasn't because he did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, if now if the report is not of this Christ that we read about in the gospel, who is it? Read on verse six. All we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep has gone astray. Read. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the most high put on Yeshua, Christ, the one whom you ignorantly call Jesus, what? The iniquity of us all. The sin of us all. He wasn't beat for what he did during his time. He was beaten, crucified for us. Because in the law, the law required a pure sacrifice a lamb without blemish. Read. Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Yet he opened not his mouth. Hold on, get Matthew 27 and 12. Who shall believe our report? 27. Uh, Matthew 27 and 12 through 14. Yes, sir. Matthew 27, verse 12. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. The he opened not his mouth. Mm -hmm. He was accused. Now, was he king? Yes, he knew he was king. But it wasn't time at that point for him to fulfill the prophecies of taking down Rome. He came to teach to lay the foundation that would gather us together again and to be that sacrifice in the earth that would gather us together in truth like you're hearing today and that would lead to his kingdom coming back to earth, him in full power as king. So yes, he was king, but when they ask him, 
You said that you can destroy this kingdom in three days and raise yours up. Who are you? Are you king? He answered them not a word. That was prophesied in the report of Isaiah that he wouldn't even answer them. And he had the power, if he wanted to, to open up the heavens, folks, and bring forth legions of angels in the earth to destroy the, the Roman Empire on the spot if he wanted to. But his love for us, his love for us, brothers and sisters, took preeminence. Because why? Prophecy had to come forth more concerning what he would do beyond his physical life amongst us. See, he answered, he answered them not a word like it was prophesied in the report. Read. Verse number 11. And Yeshua stood before them, as uh, verse number 13. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? Look how many things they're saying against you. Pilate was trying to do what? Be just. Pilate was at least saying, speak for yourself. What's your cause? Say it. If you're innocent, tell them. Read. And he answered him, never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. The, even the governor marveled greatly because Pilate and them knew that he was lying. The Gentiles knew that Christ was blameless. They marveled. They knew that if he spoke, against what the Pharisees and scribes were saying that the law, even amongst Rome would have released him. They would have had to Christ had witnesses to their lying accounts and all that and could have got gotten off. If only he said, listen, I didn't say that. This is what I meant by that. I'm not talking about right now. I later in prophecy, I'm prophesied, but I must die. He, you know what? He could have actually did what spoken for himself, testified on the stand against the lies, and they probably would have released him. <laughs> Look at that. This is how much Christ has always loved us. Like, no, I have to die for them. have to do the will of my father. Why? Because he knew that Jerusalem will be destroyed in 70 AD, that the Romans would come against us. And eventually not just the North American Indians and them that were over here would become lost, but our people, the Kings of Judea would lose our place and nation. And eventually would have no idea that we were the children of Israel in the earth. And how would we find Christ and find the truth of him without him first dying according to prophecy so that the Holy Spirit can go throughout the earth to find the children from one generation to the next? He says, listen, I must go because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit cannot come. I'm only one man in one place, but it takes the Holy Spirit to go throughout the earth to find the most High's children. He knew he must, he had to die. Who shall believe this report? And not only that, who can deny such a man? Mm -hmm. And how can anyone in the earth, including Gentiles, attempt to relegate him under a term mere prophet? Let's go back to Isaiah. Yes, sir. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Yet he opened not his mouth. Read. If I can mention just one key thing on those uh, that opening statement where it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Israel spends so much time talking about their oppression and their affliction, not realizing that a man who was guiltless. See, we were oppressed and afflicted because we were guilty. <laughs> we were guilty. This man was not guilty. <laughs> Great point. And yet was oppressed and afflicted. And really no time is given to, to acknowledge the oppression he faced as a man who was guiltless. Yeah. 
And we're complaining about what's being done to us. When what's being done to us is, is really, like you've mentioned, Elder Lawyer, we're guilty. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the white man do this or the white man do that. And there's no white man in our neighborhoods at any time trying to, you know, that's forcing us to sell drugs to each other. That's forcing us to shoot each other. At any time. And, and then, let me tell you, this not to absolve the Gentiles' conspiracies against us because we, you all know that exists. Mm -hmm. But it's not just one thing or the other. There's nuances. It's all of it. So understand what's going on here, right? Like you mentioned. Imagine being guiltless and having to go through this. Mm. <laughs> Right? Come on, let's read it out, the lawyer. Yet he opened not his mouth. Yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't even defend himself. He didn't even defend. You can be guilty here and defend yourself and get off. <laughs> he, an innocent man didn't, what? Didn't even defend himself for the love of his people. And this report is out of Isaiah 53, folks, the Old Testament. Anyone who can read this and not know it's Christ, skull and bones. They're dead already. That's right. Mm. Let's read it. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb. So he opened, he openeth not his mouth. He openeth not his mouth. He said nothing when he could have. And not only that, I can actually go into the Bible like I did with precepts to show it happened. The report fulfilled. And you have Israelites out here don't believe in Christ says, no, that's Israel it's talking about. How can Israel die for Israel, the sins of Israel? How can guilty Israel die for the sins of Israel? <laughs> Come on. Verse six again. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every last one of us went astray. None of us are innocent, according to the word. Mm. Read. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? And this happened in the, in the New Testament, where Pontius Pilate put out Barabbas before Christ. Took them both out of prison after whipping Christ and says, which of the two you want? I've already chastised him with stripes. Barabbas was a known terror amongst Israel who, who, who belonged in jail. And the Pharisees convinced the people, a lynch mob, to have Pilate release Barabbas over an innocent man. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. They cried. Now, this report obviously was fulfilled in the New Testament, but you will still have people who would deny Christ. Why? Why? Because these were the people, brothers and sisters, that aren't fit, aren't destined for the kingdom, who refuse to repent. So when they go into the Old Testament and say they're waiting for a Messiah, but yet will deny the one who came and was crucified for their sins, understand that there's no debate, no arguing with these people. They're dead already. You can't argue scriptures to someone who's spiritually blind. Read on. Verse number eight. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? He was cut out of the land of the living. That means he was crucified, he was killed, read. For the transgression of my people. For the transgression of his people. Was he stricken? Was he stricken? He died for the sins of the children of Israel. To fulfill the prophecy of that Holy Spirit going throughout the earth, throughout all generations, to gather the 12 tribes back like they once were under David. 
Excuse me. Come on. Verse number nine. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Come on. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Most High to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Uh, he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. A what? When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. This is a soul, one man. Offering for the sins of the nation. Here's the scriptures the disciples and Paul were using to teach the gospel. <laughs> a soul is a person. This one man would die for the entire nation. To be a what? His soul, an offering for sin. An offering for sin. This is, this, and through this prophecy, the Most High would not utterly cast off his people and get a new people called Gentiles for this offering. See, <laughs> for this offering of Israel, he would not now cast off his people. Even Moses, when Moses received the law and saw the disobedience happening down there at the, at the bottom of the Mount, the most High says, move out the way. I'll destroy them right now and make a nation out of you, Moses. And Moses said, yes, Lord, I understand your power. But then the Gentile nations will say that you delivered your people from Egypt with all this power to kill them. Allow me to talk with them. He said, I'll tell you what. And not too many men, the most high seen on earth as friends like Moses. He said, I'll tell you what, there will be a judgment. You go down there and talk to him. And those who stand on your side, I'll preserve. <laughs> right? Moses went down there and the Levites had their own side, had people joining them. And the Most High opened up the earth and swallowed one side where the line was. The only line that was preserved was where Moses was standing with the people behind him. But now, check out what Christ does. You think that's great with Moses. Christ says, listen, I'm going through my grace. I will die so that even the guilty, those who are against me, will have an opportunity. That's greater grace that was given during the time of Moses. <laughs> the line was made and all the guilty died. But yet those who believe in Moses will reject Christ. Christ is saying, I know you on the other side of the law. I know that you are against my God. You're even against me. And I'm still, I'm, st I will still die for you. I'll still die for you. I'll make a ransom for you. Even if you reject me, I've died. Guess what? My blood covers that too. If you one day repent and understand the value in, in knowing me, I'll forgive those evil thoughts that were against me in the past. That's how gracious our King is has always been. But you will have those who would uphold Moses over Christ. What a king. Read on. Verse number uh, 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And he shall see his seed. Now, Christ didn't have family. Mm -hmm. But you know what his seed became? Peter, the disciples, became his sons and father, fathers over the new path towards the kingdom. A new gospel, a new, a new teaching, different than any other doctrine within the earth. It's like he raised the disciples, mainly Peter and Paul and the disciples as his sons. Mm -hmm. 
as his children, knowing that he would not have any. <laughs> okay, come on. So that seed seeded a gospel that a lot of you are beholding or hearing today. Read. Verse 9, it says, uh, uh, to as many as believed on him, to him exactly. would he give power to become the sons of God. As many as believe on him, gave he power to become sons of the living God. Mm. <laughs> as many as believe mm. on him. Right. Who shall believe our report? Mm -hmm. That's right. He came into his own. His own received him not. These are those who didn't believe the report. But as many as received him, gave he power to become sons of the living God. Mm -hmm. Those who believe the report will now be adopted back into the covenant due to Christ's sacrifice. Mm. To stand as the children of Israel again, like we once did under Moses, under David. Quite simple, right? So with that, there's other things I would like to go into, but we're near the time. Christ is king and more than a prophet. The last thing I wanted to go into, I wanted to show them about the Gentiles when I said it comes with what? Conditions. The conditions Paul gave is that what? The Gentiles are not to boast against the natural branches. Let's go straight there. Romans 11, verse number. Let me go to verse number 19. Thou would say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. So and here's the verse 18. So lock read. Uh, boast not against the branches. So Christ, um, so so Paul is teaching the Gentiles in the church to respect the Israelites because this is their tree. The Israelites has has delivered the gospel to you. The Gentiles couldn't have delivered this. So Paul gave the Gentiles and condition for learning under Israelites that they're what boast not against the branches that they were not to boast against the natural branches who are Israelites. What, what is the boast? Read. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Because if you boast, you're not boasting about your history. You're boasting their history. You were, you were heathens. You were living in, you were operating under Satan in pagan temples. So if you boast after receiving this gospel, you won't be boasting concerning anything that came from your family. You're boasting concerning the history which which emboldened you, right? Read verse number nineteen. Thou wilt say then. Now Paul made it clear to the Gentiles the boast, the condition that would do what? Judge the Gentiles for disobedience, the disobedient act that would lead to a judgment against the natural Gentiles. Thou wilt say what? Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. You will say, here's the boast that Paul is telling you. You would say that the Israelites are done away with. So that now Gentiles can be received as spiritual Israelites in their place. Paul warned you not to do that. But yet, that's a core doctrinal teaching within Christianity today. He told them, listen, I, you can partake in this, this gospel, but you are not to boast against the natural branches. What is the boast? You will say that the natural branches, the physical Israelites were cut off. Read. That I might be grafted in. So that now I'm adopted as God's people. And there's no difference now. Paul told you not to do that. <laughs> the no difference doctrine is really what Paul stated as boasting against the natural branches. Mm -hmm. When they say it's no difference, that's boasting. There is a difference or the most I wouldn't have a chosen people. Read. 
verse number. If I can mention real quick, Romans 3, Paul says earlier in Romans, he says, yeah. what advantage is there to be in a Jew? What is the profit of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that which was given unto them was the oracles of God. So you can't boast against the people, even though they disobeyed God, even though they uh, rejected Christ, you can't boast against them because what you're coming into was prophesied in their oracles. Exactly. It was prophesied in their oracles, the word. Mm. So that's crystal clear. So now how can you boast of, how can you boast against them when it was their oracles, mm -hmm. their word that's given you an opportunity to prosper in it. Right. <laughs> right? Read. Yes, sir. Verse number 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. You don't stand by bloodline or prophecy concerning the promise. Gentiles stand strictly through faith, not promise. See? Read. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Come on. Be not high-minded, but fear. And this is what Paul made it clear, teaching the Gentiles. Now, you're going to get a lot of benefits in learning here. But you better not go against those who have delivered the gospel to you. By saying that it's not about our people anymore, that it's about you. Be not high-minded and get up so, so high-minded but fear. So Paul knew that a reward would come to the Gentiles that would have them what? Begin to ingratiate themselves. They would have a high ground based on all the information and blessings that comes with doing the gospel. There's a benefit there. He says, so the Most High is going to exalt you Gentiles. You're going to be in position. But remember this time in which I delivered this to you. That the blessings you, you're receiving is to continue to bless God's people. It's not for you to be in position to look at them as less than you. Because it's their oracles. It's their information that have blessed your families. Mm -hmm. See? So be not high-minded once you get in that position. So Paul knew what the Gentiles were about to get. And he knew that what pride in some of them would have them forget their teachers. Those who blessed them with the gospel and the understanding of their portion in Christ's kingdom. Last piece, read it. Yes, sir. For if God spared not the natural branches. Because if he can put his own people in captivity, according to prophecy. Take heed lest he also spare not thee. Take heed lest he spare also not thee. So understand there's conditions even for Gentiles. And th that's why I say brothers and sisters, stop looking at this as if you can judge a matter based on your feelings. Mm. The Gentiles have their conditions by the disciple who taught them Paul. Like we had our conditions through Moses and who Christ. Mm -hmm. So if if, if they boast against us and try to do something against us after delivering the word, none gets away, folks. Mm -hmm. That's right. None gets away. So I wanted to put that out there because why? The most high have given time and chance to all men, to the Jew first who are Israelites and also the Gentiles. Now, the question lies, what are you going to do with the gift of truth and the understanding of of our King. Mm. Shalom. I'll see you tomorrow in the Hebrew and Bible Academy going into who is Edom. Thank you, other Lloyd. This felt like one of those old ones right yes, there. Sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Woo! The Holy Spirit in the name of Ahia Bashim Yeshaya Wawa. Let's bring it. See y'all tomorrow in the Academy. Stay prayed up. Sin not, we will soon see Zion. To Zion. Historytimes.org.
Be there tomorrow. I was lost, but now I'm found. I'm a child of Israel. I heard the sound. I hear the sound. Please give me the strength to stand today. Yeah.